listening to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. Hello! <laughs> Hello, Johnny Albanese. Yeah, I said it. Johnny, look who's back. Look. What's up, buddy? He's still breathing. Look at him. He is. He's back. 15 he hours. Back. He's back. What? Why are you so Did quiet? You get anything? What'd you get? Nothing? No, I didn't get anything. I passed on a lot of stuff. I was sending you videos every day. Yeah, yeah. I saw that one. I'm like, ah, what are you doing? Shoot it. Like, you did you shoot that? I'm like, shoot that goddamn thing. What are you doing? I don't see no pictures. Oh, don't send me no pictures. Send, send me hot dogs. I'm sticking out of it, bro. Send me some hot dogs. I don't see no pictures of the guy skipping through the forest. I don't it's only a 32 point. I'm going for a 35. Oh, I don't yeah. know. So I'm making it up. Yeah, I'm going yeah, back yeah. out. I'm going back out. December. When are you going back out? December 1st. December first. Look at that. I, we were having this conversation this was it this morning, uh Ralph Gun uh, today. Like what I said, what do you actually do up there? Like when there's no action or what 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 could you do for like eight hours sitting in a tree stand, bro? I like, what I don't understand it. What are you doing? I mean, what am I <laughs> sitting there like the twiddle my thumb? He reads books. He does. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he misses the deer that comes shipping by, you know? No, never. never. You, you're drinking a little something? Little... I have a little stiffer I take with me. But yeah, I come out. I don't spend all day in the woods. I come out. I go out in the morning and I come out. Now, how many out. hours you stay there? You mean in the woods at, at a time? Yeah, yeah. I'm in the in the dock. I get in there about probably five thirty, and I stay until around ten. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Not that. laughs> so nobody up. cares about. Oh, we played. How'd you, how'd you do over here? You kept it on track over here. You kept yeah. the whole thing you going. Oh, we kept yeah. it on the rails, bro. All right, Guns, yeah. Did he keep it on the rails? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> we did the, the views of this. Uh, not, uh, how do you say? It? Right, I had to yell at Gons a little bit last show. I don't know what he was doing. We were playing commercials with no sound. And, uh, but it, that was that what I told you. That was all streamyard. <laughs> That was stream yard going on. Oh, oh yeah. he fumbled a little bit. He had a little fumble. Oh, then he gets nervous. I could see it in his eyes. Bro. No, like, like oh, because I don't like making mistakes. I don't wish yeah, you yeah. go wrong. It looks like know? the deer you're about to shoot, bro. Yeah, that guy. Like, he's, holy <laughs> shit, oh, man! Come on, guy. <laughs> I hate that shit. How was uh, guy... chief of department? How was he? Awesome, right? Oh, great guy. Uh, I'm trying to get his his father to come on too. Him and his father would be great. Oh, you were saying that? He's yeah, like that would be awesome. Something. He's like 85, I think, or something. That would be. Got to hit him with the line, right? Nah, you can hit him with that line. I ain't hit him with that one. <laughs> Thank God we got him before he's gone. Thank God you got on here. We didn't know how much longer you had. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I, I forgot about it. Well, let me say that to you one day, Ruffy. That's all right. Yeah. And I'll laugh the same way. You will? All right. Of course. Yeah. Well, we got a guy on who was there. He was do Stephen, he was doing it in the Bronx back in the war years, bro. 16, 17. Never heard hey, of him. Remember the. Were you supposed to go to 17? No, 33. Oh, close. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. That's in the Bronx. Bronx. Doubles. <laughs> this guy was there in the late 70s, bro. He was doing it in the 70s. It's fucking shot. Doing it in the 70s in the Bronx. We 77 some... to 99. Yeah, man. On the pipe, no less. I don't know if he yeah. was on. He one get on. I don't know if he was on during the... I got to ask him. We got to ask what? him that. if During the uh, blackout. Blackout? He probably Maybe. was. That was July 77. When did he get on? You told me. What? Yeah, we gotta look. We gotta come out, but we gotta play some uh, some commercials first. So uh, we're gonna try. Yeah. <laughs> Could you play with sound this time, bro? Possibly. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. I want to get. I oh, them, really? You know, earn their money. Will you? Godzilla, you really fumbled that? I mean, were you fumbling here? What was going on? I, that it, was played. The sound? it just didn't have any sound. I'm some of them had sound. I had a blank screen. I'm, I'm doing yeah. this on a thing. Yeah, we couldn't see him. Yeah. <laughs> he was just, he's throwing up hand I'm signals. Like, like, what is he doing? Do you yeah. want to play with himself? I don't know what he's doing back there. So here we go. Let's hear from the Jersey Fire. Established in 1930 and under the current ownership since 1987, the New Jersey Fire Equipment Company handles a complete line of fire department equipment and supplies. Headquartered in Greenbrook, the company operates full 3M Scott service facilities in Ridgefield Park and Toms River, staffed by 10 fully authorized Scott certified technicians with a fleet of six fully equipped service vans. 
All New Jersey fire technicians and sales representatives are active or retired firefighters, officers or chief officers, career and volunteer. They understand the business and the importance of their work. New Jersey Fire has represented Scott since Earl Scott entered the SCBA business at the end of World War II. Among other leading manufacturers represented by New Jersey Fire are Globe and Firedex Turnout Gear, Mercedes Hose, Task Force Tips and Akron Brass, Hygenol, Fire Hooks, Arctic Compressors, MSA Carnes Helmets, ChemGuard Foam, Alkalite and Duo Safety Ladders, BA Face Shield Protectors, Truckman's Choice Saws, Groves Gear Racks and Washer Dryers, SuperVac Fans, RPI, Streamlight, and many others. A New Jersey incorporated and based company, sales and service are limited to the state of New Jersey. Find us now at www.njfe.com. That's www.njfe.com. Great job, great job. So the next one we got is for the book, right? Yes, Which uh, Getting Salty Apparel now has on the website. So if you want to get the book, they say in New York, just uh, scurry on over, you know what I mean, to the Getting Salty uh, Apparel. And uh, you can pick that up with some other cool stuff. We don't even play our commercial anymore. We're just so uh, inundated here. But yeah, go on, play it. Do it. Here we go. Here we go. It is a book that will perhaps go down as the report from Engine Company 82 of our generation. They Saved New York, written by Glenn Uston and Dan Potter, a retired New York City firefighter, explores the men and women of the FDNY and their respective journeys into the department. From everyone, from firefighters on the fire floor to those who were in positions of command, such as lieutenant, captain, and chief, and so on and so forth, this book explores their stories told through their perspectives. Each story differs, but the mission is the same. And the common theme is this, those that put their lives in the line to save their fellow New Yorker, no matter the cost, no matter the situation, whenever they were in need. Get your hands on this book today. You will not regret it. Written by, once again, retired New York City firefighter Dan Potter and the concept and photography provided by the one and only Glenn Usden, a member of the Firebell Club in New York City. They saved New York, the men and women of the FDNY. If you'd like to purchase the book, you can do so at theysavedny.com. That is, again, www.theysavedny.com. I don't know where Mike got that music from, but it sounds like uh, the movie from Soul Glow. You guys like Soul Glow? Wow, wow. <laughs> Mr. Randy! What? what? Yeah! Come to this. Yeah! Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> there's like a that. God somewhere. <laughs> That's the best He's part. You have to there's a high. God somewhere. Yeah. yeah. God, God damn you, the Lions, then. Got the Lions. Got the Lions. That's what it sounds like you got that music from. So good, just so low. That's in high tone. Randy Watson. Mr. Randy Watson good. coming to the good. 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 That's a Mr. Sexual. Sexual chocolate. Sexual chocolate. You play so fine, don't you agree? <laughs> All right. Oh, shit. We just ran Sexual half the movie. Chocolate. I think he dropped the mic. <laughs> Eddie Murphy, when he dropped we the mic. Girl, we got a girl in the chat. WW2. Was it? Who was it? W2 girl? Yeah, yeah. WW2. Oh. The WW2 girl, yes. Wow. Where is she from? Did anybody know where she's from? Or... Uh, she had mentioned it at one time. I'm sure she'll tell us in the chat, but uh, she's, uh, she helped us a lot with the likes lately. She's been uh, pushing the group for likes. Do it, WW2 Mr. girl. Mr. Rana Washington. Where, where, where you get that name from, WW? I like it, WW2 girl. Mr. Rana Washington. Mr. Rana Watson. Yeah. Right, you want to get this guy in? We got anything yeah. else? He's in it. the background. Yeah, he's is he sick. laughing or is he sleeping? <laughs> he's got the, he's got a... Now he's giggling. You can see his body chuckling. Yeah, he's laughing. <laughs> All right, so we got a guy. Let's get him in here. This guy was here doing. If you see his lid in the background, it looks like a like a yarmulke. It's so it's burnt up, bro. Boined up. Uh, yeah. It's all point up. It's like a beanie now on his head. Well, so I got a yarmulke. Did you say yarmulke? I got one for you. <laughs> What's, going on, What's going on, Gonzo? What's going on, Milner? What's going on? His wife is Jewish. I forgot. Actually, Gonzo can't get into bed unless he's wearing the yarmulke. Right Only now, the so. better half. <laughs> Only the better half. Hard your half to uh, it. Good half. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get him in here. Rookie, do it. Come on. Ooh, right, coming to go. the stage. Engine 6 0, firefighter James Johnston. Green Beret. Hey, 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 hey. He's there. What do you mean? He's right there. You got to bring him in. He's here. Oh, all right. Now he's there. He there he is. There he is. Look at that handsome fellow with the mustache. He's still got the mustache going, bro. He's got the mustache. He's got the green beret. He's repping the green beret. He knows how Where in the back? Where is the green beret? On his uh, shirt. 
Oh, I thought he actually. Berets. I thought he was going to wear the green beret for the show. Oh, he's got. We'll it. have to find yeah. out how that happened, anyway, bro. But first, we got to get patriotic. Don's, please. Here we go. We're going to get the new one. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. That's my MJ. When do we, we get that one? Oh, well, you've been gone a while. Maybe you don't know. Yeah, wow, that's a good one. Shoes anymore, bro. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe to go up, they didn't tell you while you were away over there. Maybe we'll see you. I'll go home and get your fucking shine box. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I no, won't we'll go anymore with that. All right, word of the day, because we have a word of the day tonight, bro. We haven't done that in a while. We do. Word let of get, the let day me get rid is. Ready? Yeah, do it. Oh, oh daddy. Oh, daddy. <laughs> I'm out. Time Here comes the disclaimer. Oh, H O D. You want straight up? Oh, oh, oh no, E, no, E. Oh, no, dude, come on. What are you doing? No, oh, no, come on. Why are you doing it? Oh, like it's, it's a family show, bro. Why are you doing it? Like not ho, ho, you know, ho, 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 not. Yeah, know, like whole Santa. Year old lady ho. Oh. <laughs> you know Sorry. My mind went demented. If, if you know what it means, you get a thousand bucks. Oh, what? a thousand bucks, man! Whoa. Look at Ruffy; his eyes just lost. Nobody's a thousand ever bucks. Met. What? Never there. No one is meant. And it was it actually mean? on Jeopardy. You're actually on Jeopardy. Oh, Daddy! I want to know how you got the name, then. <laughs> I, if I tell you, you'll know how I got the name. Then you get the Jen to get the Jeezel. We got, I think we're gonna okay. we'll try to figure it out by the end of the show. We'll see if we figure so it out. Let's see if anybody in the chat knows what a ho Daddy is. You want me to? I'll wait then. Who isn't is that like? Uh, isn't that like a like a little chocolate uh, egg oh. cream or something? <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, what? Chocolate <laughs> egg cream? What? Yeah. yeah. My good. Well, I don't. I, Jimmy, I thought you had to give a disclaimer before you started. I do. I do. Yeah, read it. <laughs> My disclaimer is, since I've never let the truth get in the way of a good story, <laughs> my disclaimer is I'm not responsible for the auth authenticity of my stories. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that's go, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it is. There I was. <laughs> Fire to the left. Fire to the uh, right. Couldn't see grandbabies you know raining down grandbabies. You know, oh, you know what's man. funny about there I was is uh, we... One of my officers, I don't want to skip everything, but one of I have to reply to that. One of my officers, Phil Farrell, great, great guy. He stuttered Don, but he worked with John Mitchell, who was Metals Mitchell, one of the most decorated, probably to this day, one of the most, not deep, but medals all over the place. And he would start off with Mitchell would put it, you'd see it in the, the book, what he did. And then Farrell would then say, I the smoke was as thick as pea soup. And I was 20 feet beyond common sense. Common sense. Farrell, who is this Farrell you speak of? Farrell. <laughs> What's Damn. that? Yeah, who is this Farrell that you speak of? Farrell. Lieutenant Farrell was one of my first lieutenants. From in, what? In, in, what? 
60 engine. Oh, I thought it was the oh, other yeah. Farrell from 31. No, no, no. Full, no. full Farrell is an old time. Ah. All right. Speaking about old times, let's yes. go back. Way back. Way let's go back. back. I, uh, I imagine you were volley first oh. or because of your volley career, but let's get back to where you grew up. Uh, what made you want to be a fireman? Any family on the job or what got you interested? Yeah, no family on the job. Uh, uh, I started, I, what happened was my neighbor, Mike Kiefer, who's related to Kevin Kiefer that Lou knows, it's, it's, Mike was Kevin's older brother. And uh, we went to school together. We were best friends. His father was in the one tour fire department. So I grew up in one tour. <clears throat> and then when I, I, I wasn't quite eight, I was a little older than 18. I decided to join the one tour fire department. So it was a busy department. It was a very big department. Uh, we would get probably uh, wow. 10 or 12 jobs a year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is for, for a fire department. And I joined in 1970. And a lot of the fires at that time were uh, in the Levitt homes because we covered, one tour covered a big area. You covered parts of Seaford, parts of Belmore, parts of Levittown. So we, we covered a gym, and then we covered down at Jones Beach, which was fun for brush fires if you if you're into brush fires. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> brush fires, sub cell <laughs> But the Levitt homes were unusual because what they had, they had uh, the oil burner was actually under the stairs. All right, they had no basements, right? They were all built on yeah, a slab. Yeah, no, all on slabs with the oil burner behind the kitchen, kind of connected to the kitchen. And then it was uh, it, it, it was the stairs going up to the second floor. So most of our fires were Levitt homes where the oil burner would do something and malfunction some way, start a small fire, and it would lead up and it would go right up to the second floor. Sure. You had, you'd go up the stairs, you'd make it up the stairs and you either went right or left, depending, or you, it was might be at the stairs and it was either a bathroom or no bathroom. So you had basically two rooms and um, that's where we had a lot of Levitt fires. And they, they were good jobs. I mean, they weren't just, uh, you know, uh, one, two, three, and they're out. They were good jobs. And and what's kind of funny is when I joined, I got into hydraulics. Part of, I was a teacher of pumps, had a pump. And it took me months when I got in the city and saw the way far you could push down a hallway. And I would say, you know, we had some good firemen in one tour. Why couldn't we make the rooms like New York's? I know their experience and all that, but we, me and uh, myself, Billy Lawson, we went, went to 17 truck. We were all in together. Bobby Hunter, uh, who you guys know. Uh, we had Danny Perella, who went to 111. It was a tremendous fireman and then went to 44 truck. We were all together and we put the fire out, but it was nothing like when I got in the city. And it took me a while to realize we had an inch and a half, first of all, and we had the Navy fog nozzles. So at the time, they were putting out 42 gallons a minute. So when you had a room on fire, it took two or three lines to get one room out. Whereas in the city, the with the inch and a quarter yeah. and 180 gallons per right, minute, right, you know, right, you're knocking right. down rooms. But here I am, a pump instructor, and it took me a few months in the city to realize why the city was so much better. <laughs> was, you know, just the minute stuff. Coops, what was the name? That name that was uh, the chief from Detroit. You remember? He's like the you Rockwell. Got the Rockwell baby. Rock, you got the Rockwell. The Rockwell. You got Rockwell. the Rockwell baby. I'm swinging the Rockwell. <laughs> It was called Rockwell Navy Fog Nozzles. In mm, that's half, right. Wow. Half open position. All right, it had a couple of clicks or something, right? Yeah, 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 exactly yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. And then on the top of it, where you could put like kind of like a solid stream, you could also put an applicator in it. And so that that that's what we did in one tour. But we we had some good jobs. We had some good jobs. We had um we had a, a tragic accident. Uh, going to what I think was a false alarm. It might have been a, a, a automatic alarm in a house where our floodlight truck, the ladder was in front of it and they're returning from the call. We had a we had a midship 100 foot straight aerial ladder. And then we had a floodlight truck for obviously lights and all that stuff. And the glare hit the driver of the floodlight truck and he rear-ended the tower ladder. Uh, rear-ended our aerial ladder. And the ladder went through the windshield. Oh shit! It act, it actually 
there wasn't blood. I was a I was a captain at the time, and we were at headquarters because we were all back, and we responded to it. And he was actually pinned in, and it turned out later on it just snapped his neck. And obviously, we we didn't know that, but he was pinned in. We were just trying at the time to get it out. And at the time, this was 1970. I was in it 70, maybe 71 or 72. We used a porta power to get him out. You know, we didn't have her stool and right. where you'd pump it. Yeah, you pump jaw, it. The jaws were about that big. So uh, it, was, it was a tragic thing. He was a real well-liked guy. And uh, we had that fatality in, in one tour while, while I was there. Oh, wow. In. He died? Yeah, yeah he was just dead. Oh, yeah, wow. We didn't know that. I mean, we, the heart was going. Uh, I don't think there was breathing very light, but his neck had severed, so he had obviously no brain function, which we didn't know. Oh my God. We finally got him out. And and what was, what was bad is we had a doctor who was well known, lived on, on, it was on a main street and he lived on the main street and we sent a couple of guys down to get the doctor and he refused to come out of his house. I'm not going to mention names, but he was a long time one resident, nice guy, but when he heard what it was and what he might have, he said, I, I'm like, but I mean, we went through, we were talking about cutting his, I mean, this is how nutty we were. We, we didn't know any better. We were gonna cut his legs to try to get him out of the cab. And uh, Bobby Hunter took it the worst because Bobby Hunter was a Lieutenant on that floodlight. The guy that got killed was the captain. And Bobby obviously gave the seat to the captain. So oh Bobby, my God, so it could have been. But Bobby to this, I, I, you know, I don't bring it up anymore, but he probably, I know he took it terribly because he's thinking he should have been in the cab. But, uh, you know, things happen. The driver, yeah, you never know how it turns out. It might have not, <clears throat> that might not even have yeah. happened. No. You know what I mean? You don't yeah. know how it works out. Was, the driver was laceration, severe bleeding, bad. And Frank Seebeck, who was the officer, got killed. Wow. So it, that was That's terrible. That wasn't a good thing, but that was one of the, <clears throat> The, the things in, in you know that happened while I was in the one to a fire department, and then I guess it was a few years later, and and I'm not bragging about this, believe me, but I got elected as a deputy chief, and I was probably I think to this day one of the youngest. I I was just turning 25, and uh, you know I got in at 20, and you, you have to do a year here, year captain, and then so I got elected, and uh, it's it leads into a funny story, but. The third deputy in one tour didn't get a chief's car like they have now, all these suburbans and all these cars. The third deputy had to use his own car. And I had this, a souped up Camaro. And uh, the, our dispatcher was an auto body guy too. So he put a, a, a red light, it was, had two bulbs, a red and white bulb, and I was on my car. I, 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 on your I, camel. I, I was, <laughs> no, at the time, I was working for Geico Insurance, which was up on the North Shore. And uh, the dispatcher would call me up and say, hey, we, we got something good. You, you come down here. So I would jump in. I'd leave work. I was the only guy that was ever in the history of Geico. They had six, 700 employees that was put on probation. I felt like I, I just got out of probation. <laughs> Hey, Johnston, you're on double secret probation. <laughs> just getting up and leaving. But I would rev down the Seaford Oyster Bay, which is a main express run on Long Island. And I'd rev down to one tour and never fails. They have the highway cops and they would follow me. And they wouldn't pull me over, but they'd follow me. And we'd get, when they get to the scene, they saw the chief with a nice red car. They go, is this guy like an FBI agent? <laughs> and the chief would go, no, he's one of our volunteers. He goes, well, he, he, you don't have a car for him? He's running around. <laughs> we don't know who he is. He's doing 100 miles an hour down the seat. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. But uh, so I ran for chief. Uh, I actually ran against Bobby Hunter. And uh, I kind of <clears> regretted <throat> that. We, we were, I was great friends with his brother, good friends with Bobby. And we had the only tie in the history of one tour. There was nice. three of us And then the following week, they did a runoff. And I squeaked it out by a little bit. But uh, I lasted a year and a half in the chief's office. And uh, my father said to me, you're either going to be a volley 
Well, you're gonna. My father was a tough guy. He, as a young kid, he was a coal miner in Pennsylvania. So he's Ooh, wow. a, uh, so he said, you're either gonna be a volley, a, a volley chief, or you're gonna be a man, and you're gonna buy. You're either gonna be a volley chief and rent, or you're gonna be a man and move and buy a house. So I looked at him, and you know, being a 24, five year old kid with lights on, and you know, women and all that, I'm saying. Well, that's a tough decision, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to look for a house. I'll get a job. <laughs> <laughs> so I wound up and by the way, you need some insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so I lasted um, a year and a half in the chief's office, and then I moved out to Holbrook, which is way out. Yeah. You know, not that far, but way out in eastern Long Island. But in the meantime, I had taken a test in ninth. I didn't realize this till I met a guy. My son was playing roller hockey with the fire department the other day. And I met a guy who was going to be in my class in August. And I said, when did we take the test? I, I kind of forget. I know we got on in 77, but so we actually took the test in 1970. And uh, seven uh, years. Wow. 1970. Holy and uh, my, my, my uh, list number was two, 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 three. And what happened is, and I remember parsing, but what happened was they did the Minari, Mayor Beam was the mayor, and they did the Minari hiring where they would take for every three white people. One for three, one, right? Yes. One minority. So they did that, and then there were layoffs. So here I am, I was probably a week or two away from getting on the city. I was in the dispatch office of the one we had our own dispatcher in one tour, and the news comes on. <laughs> And my father now at this time is saying, you got to get a job. You better wake up and get a job. <laughs> uh, the news comes on and it may have been job freeze. Also, oh. especially froze. You're done. So I had been working since I was 18 at Jones Beach. And I was picking up papers for two or three years. And, you know, a kid's job, teenage job. And then I became the ambulance driver because I was a medic in one tour, a fireman, but I also was a medic. And I became an ambulance driver at Jones Beach. So, but I was just summers. And at the end of my thing, I'll tell you why the beach relates to this. I worked seven years at Jones Beach. And now, now I'm not getting on the city. And my father says, you, you got to snap out of it. So he got me into his... He, he was a treasurer of a big advertising firm in Manhattan. Right, the original building was where the World Trade Center was. Wow. But they had moved, they got bigger, so he moved to um, Broadway. I think it was 61 Broadway. Right and by Mike, Trinity, right? Trinity Church? Yes, right there? yes. He was originally on Cedar Street, which is right there. So kind of a funny story. I mean, I might be getting off track, but this is kind of a funny story. He hires me because he's treasurer. He's number is the president, vice president of my father. And my job, since I, I didn't know what advertising was, I'd gone to post-college, but basically like a lot of people, I didn't know what I was doing there. I'd leave there if there was a call, so I never really, but I did finally, <laughs> after, I, did the, I did the five-year plan instead of the four-year plan. My father was ready to kill me because my father was very brilliant and he saw me not trying to do stuff. So I'm working for him. And they give me a job where I'm hiring part-time, you know, for, for medical leave, let's say. Somebody's on leave. Secretaries. Of, and they give me this big book. And it had all these, at the time, all women. So I don't give a shoot if they're doing 50 for, I had to do typing and then they have to do stenography. That's how you hire them. And they, they'd show a picture of the girl, and then they'd say she types 55 words a minute and takes stenography. Well, you know, I, I mean, you look at, I can care less what they type. I'm going through the pictures like a <laughs> He's hot. <laughs> Next. He, he's, he's swiping left before swiping left was popular. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Grinding. So, so I, hired, I hired a bunch of people, but one girl I hired was a knockout. I mean, a hot. knockout. Nice. Oh my. He comes oh my. in, and at the time she's there, a couple of weeks, we used to go to lunch uh, down at the at the uh, at the end of Manhattan. I'm trying to see, not the seaport, but down towards the end of Manhattan, Battery Park. I was going to say Battery Park. I was, I was a sun guy because I always worked at the beach. So I love the sun. 
So this day, they're going to give me a promotion, my father's company, the president. And he says, we're going to let you do executive secretaries, not run-of-the-mill secretaries like I was doing. These are going to be secretaries for the vice president, the, the president. Yeah, he knows. You already had the hot women. You already hired enough the- hot yeah. women. Yeah. So he's like, we got to get this guy moving on up. That's it. So the first girl, they send to me. It's, it's not out of my book. This is out of reference. She had come from a big company, almost like an IBM. And she didn't like it there, so she came to this app. She was an older lady, and she's been around and knows what's going on. So I, she comes to where my office was, and I said, I got to take you to this room where you got to practice typing. There's electric typewriters there. And I, I, then the I casting gotta couch? Dictate, I got to dictate. <laughs> and, and you, you take the dictation down. Oh, so she said, I don't. She, hmm. she looked at me. She goes, son. I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't need to practice. I said, well, we have, you know, might have a different typewriter. I don't need to practice. So now I'm arguing with her that you got to practice. And I'll be in in five minutes. And then we'll go through, you know, where you're going to type <laughs> what I give you. And then she takes the other. So me, you know, being the clown, I as I leave her, like five minutes and I got to get back. I leave. And as I leave, the girl I hire calls me. We're going early to the park. And I saw her going in in the morning and she's dressed like this. She's almost in a bathing suit. I said, this is great. We're going to the park. <laughs> so I take my $10, $10 jacket off, my tie off, and I got my shirt opened up and I run the park. All right? You know where this is going? I'm laying in the park. My one friend's there is playing a guitar. I'm staring, I'm, staring, I'm, I'm staring at this girl. And all of a sudden, about 20 minutes later, I jump up. Oh, You're like, holy God. shit, this so woman's in the room. I left the lady in the room. So you I left go the back. old bag in the room, bro. <laughs> What's better? The girl at the, the back yeah. park. And this, so I run back. And as I run back, I get up to the 13th floor, the elevator door opens up. I got sunburn on my cheeks. I got my shirt open, my suit wearing in the office, and my father's at the door. And he goes, I cannot believe this. You are fired. No <laughs> way. I said, you're a treasurer. He goes, the president says we cannot have that. The lady's filing every known complaint on the man. So I got canned. So I get out. I got nothing. His old man, bro. And then you went back to the park. <laughs> he took his jacket off, bro. Anyway. I had a farewell kiss, and folks say, I see you. But I, so I left there, or got thrown out of there. My father wanted to obviously kill me. He was a tough man. <clears throat> and uh, I then, a bunch of us started taking the test for, for Washington, D.C., fire department. They were busy. And so a bunch of us volleys went down and took the test for D.C. <laughs> And uh, I did well on it. And uh, it turns out that as I was getting called for D.C., I had gone down, took in the medical, done everything. They would call me. The city called me. Wow. And that was history. But I would have – my best yeah. friend, Billy Lawson, who was a tremendous fighter, and we were volleys together, he took the D.C. and he stayed because his list number was lower than mine. He didn't get called. So he stayed there. But he eventually came back and I got on the 60 engine. And then he went to 17 truck. But that's what happened. So that was my kind of like my volley career. And uh, getting jobs. That's freaking great that he fired. You can type a thousand words per minute. What? Oh, how old are you? 70? No, we can't use you. Sorry. No, we can't use you. You can't with the skirt you. over here. Right. Right. The other girl's hot as balls. She can't spell cat, but you're hired. <laughs> Uh, she make so fire was, in my trousers. That was that was one of my. Uh, but I then went it, it, <clears> to just fast. I won't get into the volleys anymore. But fast forward, I, 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 I rejoined. I moved out of Holbrook. I moved back to one tour, and it took me about four or five years till I said, you know what? I think I want to be a volley again. And then I went up the ladder to the chief. It took eight, takes six years, and then you're a chief for two more years. So I was eight years. And that's, that was good. I mean, I had to put up with the nonsense because we did have women coming in and they were doing EMTs and you, you get guys doing this to the good picture of the girl and they call me up and say, you got to do something. You know, it was like kind of, you were like a babysitter. 
But the did they finally the give you the car though? Did they give you a car at least when you came back? Or you had to use your oh by that time. Any car you wanted. So I went up the ladder, <laughs> zero three, zero two. And what was good about that, and I'm glad I went back, is the friendships I made. I'm getting a little teary, but Ronnie Geese and I were chiefs together. Uh, oh, wow. Ronnie Cohen and I, uh, Dennis wow. Murphy. Dennis Murphy, I believe, was commissioner then. And we all had a ball. You know, we all loved this. We were all city finally just about. You know, mm. there were, there's probably a couple others I'm missing, but the group by the towns I were, like Ronnie Geese was in Merrill, right near where I was in one tour. And we'd go on conventions together, and it was just a, a great time. And I'm glad I went back and went through the chief's office. I turned in. I turned out, I believe, from being the youngest chief, you know, deputy, to when I got out of the chief's office, I think I was the oldest chief. They wanted to right, get I was ready, I was ready to go. Eight years is enough. And then you try to bring your car in. Oh, my God. I remember. Where, at the 60 oh, engine? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you crazy? I brought the car in when I went out. The light bar was off and the wheels were all taken off the car. No lie. I believe at, it. At, at, the time, at the time, there was a John Sir Salker. I, I only met him a couple of times. He was bouncing through. I don't know if he was a battalion chief, whatever. He would come with his chief's car. Nobody would touch him. But it was my firehouse. <laughs> and who the heck did it? Well, a little something like this. Yeah. Huh? Why they're on the blocks. So finally, uh, in 77, I get, I never thought the list would be reinstated. It was gone, you know, 1970, you take the test and now you get, you know, 1977. So I wind up that I'm going to, I'm on, you know, in probie school. And that was kind of funny because I, I in 77, I brought <clears throat> my deputy's car there. I oh, that goes over good too. <laughs> <laughs> With they the, love that. With the gumball machine. And we yeah, were the, the first class now. They hadn't had probies. We were in the new academy. They hadn't had probies in I don't know how many years because they were late all that. So they would we were like red meat to them. We didn't have we didn't have gear. You probably heard guys on the show. We had the yellow helmets. They were uh, civil defense helmets. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, had, yeah. And you had a yellow raincoat. And they were we called them slickers. I think we had boots. And uh, the class was unbelievable because the guys in the class, in fact, one of them, two of them went in my class. The two oldest guys in probie school went to 60 with me. They were 35 <laughs> years old. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was 26. I thought I was old. They were 35 and we'd be running around, you know, the course because you had to run in the morning. I was out there. It's hot. I was out there in August. Like, and you run around and like these two guys who I, I didn't know. One turned out to be a volley in the next town, we became great. We're still to this day like brothers, but they would take your pulse. They wouldn't let them run. The instructors go, <laughs> you guys can't run. Just Yo, Grandpa. Take, <laughs> take, take, take everybody's pulse, and that's what they did. And uh, a friend of mine in the Valleys uh, says, listen, I got a chief saying from the Bronx, lives next door to me. And the way I got studying is one of the guys in the Valley who taught me, who kind of was our instructor when I joined the Valleys. One was from, uh, actually I found the latest, was in 17 truck for a year, but then he went to rescue four, big guy, great guy. Uh, Don McKay went to rescue four. And then the other guy, uh, I believe Heffernan, Heffernan was in, you know, you know, the Heffernan distributor. I think he was in one tour too, but I'm pretty sure he was. And then the other guy that, that got me into taking a test was in 302 and 155. And he actually brought us in for a tour. And I thought it was great. I mean, they had a run. And uh, we all go and jump on the rig. And the 302's out the door. 155 doesn't start. And sit, I mean, it's not starting. And they're sitting there. And I'm going, what the freak's going on? Is the truck going? He's just sitting on here. And they said, no, no, we're waiting for the shelf. He's probably taking a piss. And there he is taking a piss in a slop sink. And I'm saying, this is great. Oh, this great. is yeah. great. <laughs> So we went out, and I, that's when I got interested in job, and I took the test, and like I said, got on 77. But while I'm in probie school, I made one mistake. One of the instructors was... You mean besides ready. bringing the volley car, car to, the, to the probie school? <laughs> besides that. <laughs> so this guy is, is first... I, I can't think of his name now, but he was a big bruiser. He was missing a finger. He was in Rescue 3. He was a lieutenant. And he's... He's out there and he's giving this speech the first or second day of probing school. And he goes, 
There's a car in the parking lot. I don't really know what it is, but it's a blue Camaro with some gun ball on the top of the roof. <laughs> and he goes, if I see the car again, it's going to be parked in Queen, and whoever owns it is going to be walking to Proby School from Queen. That's it with the car, no more. <laughs> <laughs> they hated, you know, they hated Bobby. When I got to 16 yeah. or 17, they hated Bobby. So I, my friend tells me he's got a hook. He's a chief say he's going to get you to 46 engine, which I don't know nothing about, nothing in the city. All I know is I rode once with three up there. And I wanted to go to, obviously, I love flyers. To this day, I love flyers. I wanted to go to a busy company. So I'm going to 46. I go, oh, maybe they're busy. I don't know. So I'm sitting in the lunchroom, and I always saw a couple of times a week 60 engine at the rock. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, they're out here a lot. Maybe they're training. I don't know what they're doing. But what it was was the captain of 60 engine was Gene Marvin. I think he has a couple of sons who are chiefs on the job. I don't know if they still are, but he was my, he turned out to be my captain. But he would take 60 out. And he picked the brains of the instructors. Who knows what they're doing out here? Because we are getting on the job, and guys from the war years are going. They're leaving. You know, they've had enough. Most of them have had enough. You know, he's at the rock. I'm sitting eating lunch, and I see this captain standing before him. And he goes, are you Johnston? I get up. I salute him. I go, yes, sir. He said, uh, would you like to go to 60 Engine? So me, like an idiot, I go, well, are you busy? <laughs> so I don't know. So he goes, well, we do 60, they had just done 66, 79. I always remember that runs. And he goes in and we get two or three jobs a day. There's my hand goes up, forget 46. I don't know where they are, but it turned out there was probably was as busy as 60. So what made me go is he goes, see that idiot over there? See that idiot over there? No, that idiot over there and those two old guys. They're coming. Would you like to go? And I, I knew of him from the, from the, you know, the academy. I'll be school. So right? I said, I'm going. So we wind up all four of us going to 60 engine. Wow. We, we had Jimmy Cochran who wound up all great guys, but he wound up, uh, uh, he wound up in a uh, Lieutenant rescue three. And then he went to rescue one as a Lieutenant. And he was a fireman in Elizabeth, New Jersey, which was pretty busy. So he was there. Mike Steele, who you'll hear him mention throughout my story, he was my buddy. We would nozzle and back up for almost every job we ever had. We had to be together at uh, at least 200 good jobs where I was on the nozzle and he was my backup. He was a Vietnam fan. He was a Marine in Vietnam. And then Jimmy Lafferty, who was the oldest guy in the probie class, uh, they had said to him, they go, uh, what did you do before this? And he goes, oh, I'm a bartender. I own a bar. They go, you better go back to the bar. You're done with your <laughs> you know, he's out of shape, big, but a great, I mean, a great guy. And he wound up being one of our best chauffeurs. He wound up getting the 60 and being, but, but what was funny is I, now Marmon says to me, I said, well, sir, I got a hook to go to 46. He goes, nobody's got a hook like me. Me and Crothers are like this. Crothers, not the kid Crothers, the old, the, the father who's long dead, but he lived in Massapequa. And Marmon was a commissioner of Jericho, fire commissioner. He goes, whatever I say, you're going. So I said, I'll go to 60. I'm going to go with three guys I know of the academy. And I'll go yeah. there and we'll see what happens. That's great. So it was funny that we had a lieutenant instructor and he did ladders in the afternoon. And he'd come in in the morning, big guy, he looked like a St. Bernard. And he'd come in in the morning, Bit and polish, you know, the, the, everything good, the shirt, the pie, you know, with the hat and all that. And I had him, my squad, I think we only had 125 in our probing class. Like I said, the rock was brand new. And uh, we went for six weeks. And so he, I would see him for ladders in the afternoon. I look at him in the morning, the afternoon, no tie. No tie. <laughs> Shoveled. And he was... <laughs> you, know, you knew he had a few sodas for lunch, that's for sure. Yeah, and yeah. He had yeah. 17 on his game. So when they come out where they're telling you the company, he runs. I mean, I didn't know the guy could run. He runs up to me and he's got me in a bear hug. He goes, You're going to a house. You're gonna have a ball. He goes, You like fire? I said, Yeah. He goes, Do you like to have fun? I said, Yeah. He goes, You're, <laughs> you're in the right place. <laughs> you're in the right spot, kid. You're in the right spot. So I wound up going to 60. And uh, I get there. And, you know, you've heard these stories. I, I go through the Bronx. I don't know where I'm going. I went in with 
Jimmy Lafferty from Massapequa, with the old time. He's with me. And uh, I, I see all the buildings, you know, occupied, but it, you know, burnt out, burnt out windows, you know, boarded yeah, out. It was it was, some of those I pictures, mean, guns. It was, the it was, it was, it was look like this, Jimmy. I'm going to look. It's yeah. Gone, yeah. 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 A lot of them are like that. A lot of them are like that. There's your, uh, there's your car. <laughs> they took my dome light off. They took my dome light. Yeah. Holy shit, man. I think that might have been the, no, that's not I thought that was a casket factory. No, I have that up there. And then there's this one too. That's insane. Man. Kid, so, back, little... so back then, 16 and 17, they were like right that that was the South Bronx, correct? That was like right 16 in the and 17, other than 83 and 29, which right. were the bums on the hill, we were the south, south. South, you could go. You know, we were. You know, I learned what the South Bronx meant. I didn't know what it meant, but tradition was we. You know, you told if you met a girl, or you met somebody, you'd say, "I'm in the South Bronx fire." You know, now the South Bronx is going. I don't know where up the whatever companies they were, but we. Yeah, you know, we were the original South Bronx, and I got there and I remember my captain, uh, Marmon. He's recruit us, and he lines all four of us up. He had us all come a day early, whatever it was, and he lines us up. And he goes, Justin, you're going to be with Lieutenant Farrell, who was a great grand, old, salty, stutterer, tremendous fire. You're going to be with him. He goes, Cochrane, you're going to be with this lieutenant. And Mike Steele, my partner, uh, he says to somebody else, you're going to be here. And then he grabs Mike Steele, who turned out to be my best friend. I mean, a tremendous fireman backed me up on every job we had. And he goes, and you're going to go with Lieutenant Pampalone. Well, Pampalone, we didn't know, had a, one of the toughest, toughest, intimidating person you ever want to see. And so the captain goes to steal. I'm putting you with him because you are a Marine. And he wants to kill somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you can handle it. <laughs> he was petrified. But I, had, I, I, I got Phil Farrell as my boss. He calls me in. And the first, the first tour was a rainy night. And, you know, I just thought if it's a nice night, we're going to be busy. You know, I don't know what I'm expecting, but I figure rain, you know, you always got to be rain. quiet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So all the guys in the volleys had the depart, had the city Bronx radio on. So they're all the volleys are listening. I go off to work to work the night tour and I walk in and Phil Farrell's the boss. And he's sitting at the desk with my delegate that was a senior guy. He's the delegate. And they had a big bottle of soda on the desk. And uh, I'm looking at this. I'm going, man, I'm in the right house. This is going <laughs> to be beautiful. And they thought when they heard my name, Johnson, they thought one thing. But then when they saw me, John Stein, I really got spoiled. I don't know why God was with me, but they, they treated me almost like so I walk in. Farrell goes, hey, Johnson, I don't think that he's dead. Well, he's dead now, but I think for the five or six, he never knew my first name. He was always Johnson. <laughs> so goes, Johnson. Johnson, Johnson you, you know what I want to do? I, and I'm, I'm brand new. I said, Lou, I have, I, you know, I'm, I'm here a minute. I don't, I, what do you want to do? He goes, well, first have some of the soda. I said, yeah, all right. If, 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 you know, whatever. So I have a little soda and he goes, Here's what I want to do. I, I, I want to die in a fire. The whole company, we're going to die in a fire. I'm looking at him. He's like, hey, he, he wants to die in a fire. No, I'm not jerking anybody off. This is, I'm brand new. I'm there five minutes. And he wants to I'm there five minutes. I'm like, I got to get the hell out of here. And it turned out he had a massive heart attack, had a job, but died a little while later. But he almost had his wish. He almost he had his wish. Way to scare the first. shit out of Toby, right? <laughs> hey, I want to die in a fire. <laughs> and the best he didn't call him by his first name the whole time he knew him. Proves he meant it. This guy meant I mean, he wasn't, you know, like the guy would laugh. Yeah. He meant this. And we're going to die. In a, that's what I want to do. That's my life. <laughs> and whenever we had a job, we never really were. I don't want guys, the people listening, you wear a mask, but a lot of us didn't do that. And he wouldn't wear one. And he would give the score of the fire. Fire three, fireman nothing. Fire four, fireman nothing. <laughs> and then eventually, you know, we, we even up the score. 
he was he was studying to be a nurse, <coughs> and, and he couldn't pass the test. And he was what you you guys know what Mondo is, right? When you yeah yeah yeah, you go out to dumpsters and all. Yeah yeah yeah, yeah. He was the Mondo guy, and he he couldn't pass. It turned out he never passed the nursing test, but he didn't be in the back. And Marmon now was there a year, and he leaves. We were in the basement having a retirement party for one of the chiefs battalion because we had a battalion chief with us, and Marmon's hugging us, all of us, all four of us. And he goes, I'm never leaving you guys. No lie. The next day was Thursday. He's gone. He's gone. <laughs> <laughs> One year. That was coming. <laughs> I love you guys. I'm never leaving. Take care. And See you. I, had, I wanted to find that picture, but he's got his hug. You know, the, the basement is, you know, soup to nuts. Everybody's. And he grabbed us for a picture. And he left. He, he had a tremendous hook. He was a fireman in 127. I believe he might have even been a captain there went back as a, as a, a lieutenant there and went back as a captain because he, him and Crothers were very close. And if I had stayed, if he had stayed there, I might have studied. He hated the truck and uh, the truck were all, the engine too, but the truck still were all salty guys. Patty McAndrews, who you have that picture of me and Patty uh, in 60 at the hydrant, Patty was, took me under his wing. He was, that's Patty. Real Irish guy, because we were Irish. in Irish house, obviously. And he was, a, he was like my father. We were very, very, very close. Him, me, and Mike Steele, my partner, with us three were very good. Patty was a chauffeur when I got there. And I would sit and listen to his stories, Patty Mack. It, it was incredible because... I wanted to do those years that I missed. You know, you took the test in 70. The yeah, war you years, get, 10, yes, seven years. 68 to 75 were really the war years. I mean, I saw a lot, but Patty would sit there and he goes, hey, kid, he goes, and I'd pick his brain because I loved hearing fire stories. And he would say, we used to have five sections of 60 on a weekend night lined up where you walked in, say it's 288. I'm 288, the house watch guy. Okay, you're the second section of 60. Then another company, say from Manhattan. That's crazy, yeah. man. The other th he said it was it was incredible. Crazy. And at the time, they had 17-2, 17, 60. And then you picture four or five engines sitting in the street and maybe a towel, you know, another ladder. And these guys were all in the firehouse. And the, the firehouse was crazy without them. <laughs> I mean, they was out of control. So there was how many guys are in there? There's got to be there had to be oh, there 25 guys there. Yeah, and the chief, the chief's there. 30 then, guys there. How many more guys can you fit in there? A lot, he said, a lot but more. they they had enough <laughs> jobs for everybody. In fact, the blessing was our basement where we conducted a lot of our board meetings. The basement had <laughs> the basement had jacks. They used to hold up the floor. In fact, they only right. just did the floor a few years back, but the floor was sad where the tower ladder was, and we had jacks. And they were, every, they were every two feet away. Yeah, we had them too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like doing it. You'd be in a basement at a board meeting. The run would come in. It was like a DWI test. <laughs> <laughs> and they're close together, by the way. They're, they're, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and, and the yeah. screws stick out. If you if you hit them, it hurts, yes. man. And the, and the injuries, we had more injuries going from the basement <laughs> up to the um, Allegedly. Yeah, it was I mean, it was fantastic. <laughs> Hey, who do we have from 17 2? John, uh, John Creasy? Was he there? Well, uh, we had Captain uh, Captain Laffey, too, right? Oh, Laffey Captain was 17, I believe. 17, yes. 17 there. That's what I was mad at. You got me following Captain Laffey, 92, and then Chief Hodges, and now you got me on there. <laughs> <laughs> and coming to the stage. <laughs> Jimmy. But, but I, oh, I, Daddy. Oh. Oh. Oh, well, well, hold on. Here it is. So when I got I had, to six, I when to I got crazy. to sixty, a lot of the guys were leaving. A uh, couple of promotions, <clears> but mainly they were <throat> they were burnt out. You know, they, you don't you expect that they were burnt out, and the fires they went through were tremendous. But uh, the truck, 
I had three or four guys that were tremendous. You know, I'm going to use the word tremendous a lot because there's no other way to describe these guys. They were right. tremendous linemen. Uh, they liked to have fun, but they were tremendous. I had Dennis O'Connor, Paul Tangerman, uh, Tommy Mahoney was a chauffeur. Uh, a bunch of these guys, which Dennis O'Connor, I think I said, and guys like that, who, who uh, Joe Sullivan was one of the best Muslim men I ever saw in my life. Um, and they were all tough guys. And then the truck had real senior guys that took crap from nobody. Nobody told anybody there what to do. If you went to a job, you heard nothing on the radio. You might hear the, you heard star water, you heard shut down, and you might occasionally hear the OV if he went if he went to the rear and you know <clears throat> reported from the rear. Otherwise, you heard nothing from the job. We every guy knew exactly what they do, and it was funny because I'm listening to some of your podcasts, and I'm not knocking my house. Believe me, they were great. But some of your podcasts have a. I learned from this guy. I learned from this guy. I learned from this guy. All due respect, I learned from nobody. You just <laughs> did your job. They didn't. They didn't go, well, listen, hit it overhead and wipe it around or, or put the ladder up this way. You did your job. And they just, they would be with you, but you you, you did, you know, what, what you were supposed to do. And there were times with mm-hmm. the lieutenant, we got in the three classes that was on my list. And then the list ended. The, the last class was December. They had... Um, 10 guys came to the firehouse. So that's a lot. You know, you have 50 yeah. on the roster. You have a few guys on medical leave. And, uh, you know, so 10 of us. So a lot of them were in the engine. So my lieutenant would be turning around and there's three pumpkin shields looking at him. You know, the three are And he'd be looking. <laughs> what the, and we're going out the door to a, to a job. But uh, to get back to the beginning, we had, um, we had uh, three jobs my first night. We had a. Uh, I love. I love Rose. how he gets emotional like that when he's Rain talking about night. the guys. Yeah, yeah, it's great. We had three jobs. Yeah, I get teary when I think about the. Fire. Yeah, it's good, man. It's good stuff. Yeah, and uh, we had uh, a ten thirty, which is a signal you guys know, and they did away with that. But that two was and two. two and two. Yeah. And uh, we were first due for that. Then we had a, a ten seventy five all hands, and then uh, which was partially occupied. And then the last fire was a second alarm where we were second due. So that was my first night tour. And, you know, <laughs> you, you, you saw these guys in action. I mean, this is one of the fires, you know, I don't the, remember. The partially occupied, the partially but, occupied, yeah, you mentioned. Yeah. But uh, that was my first night. So it, it was exciting. And I mean, the guys took, I'll tell you, I, I think I can tell these stories. I'm there <laughs> within one month. Now I'm there one month. Roughly, give and take. Mike Steele and I kind of always like to work together, one in the same group. So we, we were allowed to do 24s almost immediately. So that was good. And the guys, the old timers wanted that. Before we got there, they were straight tours. So they always straight up. tours, right? Yeah. They yeah, were yeah. beat up. When I got there, you could do 24s. So I'm there within a month. The senior man in the truck smacks a covering lieutenant in the face. Uh, Ooh. We, I have, uh, we had a, a, one of our senior truck guys, great guy. He handcuffs the chief to the desk in the chief's office. <laughs> and I'm downstairs with Mike Steele, my partner. And we're new, but we're in the basement, which was kind of like a study room. And all the senior men with truck were down there. And there was a guy, John Fulham, great, great guy. He had made a rescue and got a big medal. I believe his partner did too. What he did is he hung off his partner who was muscle bound, just solid muscle, Vietnam sniper, held his legs and he reached over the brown stone. Come on. He reached over and pulled the lady up from the top of the brown stone up onto the roof. It was so good. I, I, it was before, just before I got there, it was so good that the chiefs, the deputies came down and they said, we want you to reenact that. We don't believe this happened. So they got the two, John Fulham and Tom Cree, the Vietnam sniper, reenacted this, what they did. <laughs> they not over the parapet. Not over the parapet. Laying on the roof with one. You know how you have, you have to trust that guy? <laughs> Holy mackerel. So 
Uh, so after they reenacted it, did they get the did they get the medal then? Yeah, they got the <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah, you get fucking a, they got the medal. They got two for doing it. But um, nice. The first incident, the chauffeur was coming in and he was he bartended during the day, and he comes into work and he was a little late. Senior man in the truck, Ray Fine, Ray Fine, and uh, this guy's <clears> covering. <throat> he's a brand new lieutenant. He doesn't know what's going on. I forget where he's from, but he's not from a busy area. And he goes, who's my chauffeur? And I said, he'll be in about a half hour, 45 minutes. He goes, well, you, it's, you know, 6.30 now. He'll be here. So he comes in and he looks at me, he goes, you're not driving me. And uh, Willie goes, what'd you just say? He goes, you're not driving me. Meanwhile, Willie's been a senior chauffeur for 15 years over there. Yeah, 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 yeah. He goes, no, no, I'm the chauffeur. I'm driving the rig. If you want to sit next to me, you can't. <laughs> goes, I don't know where you're going to be. I know where I'm going to be. I don't know where you're going to be, but exactly, I know where I'm going to be. Exactly what he said. So he, he winds up, the lieutenant said something to him, and he smacked him. And luckily, we had Chief Patterson was a great, well, I'm saying great a lot, but they were. He was a, a black chief, the calmest guy I ever saw in my entire life. He would, awesome. as the companies would come in on a second or third alarm, he would shake everybody's <laughs> hand. And so, <laughs> right? Gonzo, put that one down in the book, Gonzo. <laughs> yeah. I'll do so, that. Uh, Let me write it down right now. <laughs> Lieutenant Rufino, who are you with? Uh, I'm with the uh, 71. All right. Do you think you could get a line for me and just, that's the way he acted. The building's fully involved and he's, could you get a line here? Could calm this guy. He happened to be awesome. the chief that night. And he called the new lieutenant up and he says, how long have you been bouncing? And the lieutenant goes, well, I'm brand new, maybe a week, two weeks. He goes, I'm going to get your spot. Nothing happened here tonight and I'm getting your spot. And that's what happened. He said, wow. You know how to then, squash it, then, huh? And then one of our chiefs, good guy, but he used to make sure you knew he was the chief like, and he was a little guy, smaller than me. We call him shorty pants. He he mouthed off to probably our toughest guy in the truck. Great, great guy. Great fireman, but a tough, tough guy. And he mouthed off to him, and he had been a cop. He went up to his locker, took handcuffs, and he handcuffed him in the chair. In the chief room. And he says, you're not getting out of the handcuffs, so you apologize to me. They get a run. Just as he's being handcuffed, they get a run. Everybody goes. It turned out not to be a job, but it was everybody's going. We don't know what we got. And he goes downstairs, and he tells the aide, the chief's not going to make this one. I suggest you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <coughs> so he that apologized. Was, that was and then the third incident, this is all within a month. So I'm brand new. And I see these, you know. Fucking these, mayhem. You talk about salty guys. These guys are salty. The third one is I'm in the basement with Mike Steele. We're sitting opposite one another. Long table. We got a long table. And John Fulham, who had just made the rescue a few months prior, Wanted to go. He burnt out. He wanted to go to 127 truck. So he's sitting at the table, all a bunch of senior guys and me and Mike Steele. And Shorty Pants comes down and he says, Johnny, the order just, the order just came out and guess what? You're not on the order. So he goes crazy because he wanted, to, he thought he was going to be on that order. And the chief just rubbed it in. Guess what? You're not on the order. Well, Fulham takes a six pack of Coke and flings it at the chief. And he flings it at him. Well, me and Mike, we're there a month. We go under the table. It was like the three stooges. We bump heads under the table <laughs> and we crawl out of the We go and somebody's getting hooked up. I mean, right? You, you throw yeah. a six pack at the chief, getting hooked up. So we stuck out of there. But that, that's all within a month that happened. It was like a Oh, oh, there he is. There he is. Wait. Hmm? Ah, we lost the sound. He's got to go out. Right. Show him the sign again, Ruffy. Dude, that guy is funny, man. Holy mackerel. Yeah, he's looked so mayhem that was going on in the fucking 70s. Holy, Holy mackerel. Yeah. Yeah, the guy's there too. a month. This was one of his jobs that he was talking about, too. I said, while he's coming in, Let's see if he uh, comes back. Well, we have that Brooklyn picture too, Coops. If you want to, no, we'll do it at the end. It was, it right. was a uh, three bagger from. Uh, he's back in. Oh, he's back out. Oh, he's back oh, in. There we go. 
No, huh. nope, no sound. Go back out. How come? What do you think that's happening? I don't know. It's his. Uh, he's on an older iPad. He said so. Um, we'll have to get his know, wife in there to help him. He might have to. Oh, there, he just disconnected. So I told you it was going to be a great podcast. Oh man! So right. holy Christ! I got a guy. We, we, didn't even, we didn't even get. It's just still his first month, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> We didn't even start talking about any of the stories he told me about yet. See now. Come on. No, no, I don't, no, no good. No bueno. No bueno. Did Is he, he muted? muted? No, no. He's no. not muted here. No, he was uh hmm. what could we what did we have to do, Gons? What do you think? Exactly that. He was fine, and uh when we had to send him out and bring him back in, it, it worked fine. So he'll have to try to do it again. One more time, try to go back out. No. Two. Pew, pew. Let me, I'll kick him out myself. Let me see what happens and tell him to come back in. See if by us kicking What'd him out. What did you do we'll last see. time? You kicked him out? No, uh, exactly what we just did. We, that's why I told him, go out and come back in. John and Richter it. says Jimmy was a riot. I was in the volleys with him. I'll bet, man. Fucking guy has me. My face hurts. My face hurts. Somewhere. It's yeah. only an hour. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm trying to think what we're going to do if he can't get on. Like, what? Uh... Is he on the phone? <laughs> Let me get on his phone. Yeah, yeah. You can give him a I'm gonna take a quick whiz. Yeah, give him a holler. See if he comes back in. Well, anyway, stand by, folks. Oh, let's see. We yeah. On? yeah, we're good. There you are. I, I want to edit time on this. You know, I want more time now. <laughs> we'll add a little bit more for you, Lou. You're muted. You're muted. You muted. Well, anyway, I said you got it. We'll add you. To, we'll add the three minutes for you, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> I have I have Lieutenant Farrell. Like I said, he's the Mongo guy. And one morning he gets up, and I was kind of like a late guy. I used to like to get up maybe nine thirty, ten o'clock. So he wakes me up and he goes, Johnson, check your check, check, check. Round up the boys. <laughs> Lou, it's ten o'clock. What what's going on? We're, we're getting cobblestones. Because where I worked, which was good, is we had the tenements, the old law, new law tenements. We had a commercial area, and we had brownstone. So we had a little bit of everything. You know, we get the car fires left and right every day, two or three car fires. So he says, round up the men. We're getting cobblestones way at the ass end of our district. So we go down there. We're loading the cobblestones. We got the hose bed packed. And his thing was, you make me... You, if if I'm happy, if Mary's happy, his wife, I'm happy, and if I'm happy, you guys are happy. <laughs> oh right. yeah! Round the boys up. We get the cobblestones. We get a job, and it's we're supposed to be second do, and we wind up. You know, it happens. You're out of bi or something or whatever. We wind up third do. Bi. What's this bi we, you speak of? Yeah, but we never did that. <laughs> but our chief, our chief. Um, we had a chief in the two six came down instead of one four for this fire. One four must have been out, and it was a guy that was a grumpy, grumpy chief. I don't even know why he's on the job, but it should have been somewhere else. But he would yell at everything. So now we pull in third do. We race down. We pull in third do, and he meets us at the engine, and he's screaming at us, "Get another line! We're losing it! Get another line!" So Mike and I jump off the back. Mike's my partner. Me, I got the knob. As we get to the back, we both remember the hose bed is covered with cobblestones. With cobblestones, holy <laughs> shit! You can't, <laughs> you can't pull nothing. So the chief goes back to like the command, you know, to the <coughs> building, and he looks down the block, and all you see is hands screaming at us. You put your ass on, and send the uh, cobblestones are being thrown. <laughs> 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 that was Phil Fowler. He just was a, a great, great guy. And it was funny because the chauffeur we had, his chauffeur was Louis Morales, another good, good guy. But for some reason, at times, Louis was a good fireman, didn't want to be a chauffeur. Mm-hmm. But we were all young, so they said, Louis, you got you to gotta go to chauffeur school because, you know, Johnson's you're here a year or two and blah, blah, blah. So Louis would drive, but he would always make a hat. If it was multiple lines, and we were the first two, we would get charged, our line would get charged third two. 
And Farrell would always run out of the office and forget something. Well, we had a good job. It was a top floor fire. We're first two, but our fourth guy broke it down and hooked on the opposite side, the on the officer side. The next company comes in, hooked in front of Louie. Phil Farrell, great fireman who wanted to die in a fire. He's got cane shoes on, no boots, cane shoes. You know, they're like with canes on it. And it, it, the fire was roaring through the department door, and we got no water. And I, I had hit the hose, and it must have been a residual of water from whatever else happened, and maybe a spit got out. <laughs> and it was enough that between the heat of the fire and and the little bit of water that fell out of the nozzle, foul shoes are on fire. And, you know, <laughs> And he's, he's hopping, and at the same time, he's the guy that started. He's trying to call Louie. You, Louie, you went. Is this something you can It was just a funny oh He started out 5 nothing. fire was winning. <laughs> 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 Five nothing. <laughs> that was still Farrell. The last Farrell story is Oh uh, my God. He mongoed and he had a daughter who turned out to be a cop. But she at the time she was a young, you know, maybe 17 or 18. But a, a tough girl. So he he gets we're working a night tour and he says, uh, load up your sodas on the rig. We're going about eight blocks, we had one street that nobody knew the name of it. It was like a rare street with just a block and it was nothing on it. But he found coming in, he used to scout around because he loved cars and he wants to mongo this car. And it's pouring rain. So he's out with wrenches and pliers and everything. He's trying to get the transmission out of this freaking car to get up, you know, it's up on block and he's trying to get this trans to drop the transmission. And it's raining, so we're sitting in the cab and we're watching this out. So next thing you know, he comes back to the cab and I figure he's gonna tell us to help him. So he comes up, he opens the door and we're having a good time. You know, we're in the cab, we're just having some fun. And he goes, put that stuff down. So we drop what we're doing, drinking, you know, soda and we put it down and he goes, get the tow cables out. So I think, <laughs> what? He goes, shut, 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 shut. You would see, set the cables out. He wants to tow the car, eight blocks, with no wheels, nothing. So I look at him, I go, you gotta be freaking kidding me. You know, and I always respect him. He was a great guy, but I used to tease him. I go, yeah, it's got nothing on it. It's gonna, well, we towed the car, like eight blocks through the South Bronx, with sparks shooting all over. <laughs> <laughs> and he got, he got it back into the firehouse where we, you know, would um, where he could work on it. We had a little park around. He worked on a freaking car, but he, he was just a funny guy, a good fireman, and uh, you know, he like I said, he had the, he wanted to die in a fire, and he had the heart attack and oh my died a little later. But he was a, he was a real good guy. But mm. one thing I missed, I know I missed a lot. And I don't mean to bore you guys, but no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm bored. I'm very bored. <laughs> one thing I missed is when I got there, that was very depressing is we had an interchange and you've heard about the interchange yep. and uh one thing i wanted to ask a, a little quiz question i don't know if you had it on any of your podcasts but on the side of our engine 60 we had a 75 mac there was a whale on it you know what that was a whale it's not a the ra whale. that was a rapid water rapid right? water yeah it was rapid so water. water we had that and the first couple of jobs we go to it was supposed to cut down the friction loss. You right, know, right, right. Like slip it, slip it through or something, right? And we'd be sliding all over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and once they charge the line, you know what I mean? You'd have it on your shoes going up on the stair, and it it, 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 it was unbelievable. But the dis the press the pressing part was we had to interchange, and every third night you left. So you, you, us young guys, we couldn't pick. What I'm working with with Lou with Coops and stuff like that, Gonzo, they would tell you when you worked the 24, and you'd always get stuck. And we'd be out in, in our company was 316 was our interchange, and then my second year we went to 259, and you'd sit out there, and you hear 
Bronx announcing all hands or the second alarm in the beat. We had two one boxes, two one and two two, two one, two three. And you know, it's the print. We want to fight fires. So our chief, our captain, used to call up. Well, the first thing with 316 is they had we had to shovel coal to keep the heat on. And this one night we go out to 316, and we used to always have fun going there. We're single engine, we do whatever. I mean, we had fun everywhere, but we were just a fun bright bunch of guys who we think were good firemen. That's the motto. And we go out to 316, and one thing leads to another, and nobody's thinking about shoveling coal. We're all in that mood. Who shovel coal? We forget about it. We get up in the morning because they used to bring our rig back, and then we get it. That's how it worked. Because we'd leave a man back, and our rig was packed for the Bronx, and their rig was packed for Queens Fire. And you know 316, single out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had barn doors they used to open, no electric doors. You used to open the barn door. Kearney Street, I think. Kearney Street. Yeah, I think you're right on that. Yeah, I yeah. think you're right. So we we don't shovel the coal. And what happens is, is the fire goes out. Now, I know nothing about coal fires. But I found out quickly that when coal goes out, hours and hours for to get stoke up, to get the heat And it started again, right? Yeah. But yeah. we get up in the morning. Mike and I, again, my partner working. We get up in the morning go. Man, it's cold in here. <laughs> we both look at each other. Oh my God. So they pull the rig in and we no hello, goodbye. We jump in the <laughs> See ya. We get back to quarters. Sure enough, the phone rings like an idiot. I don't know who it is. I answer the house what six sixty seventeen but fireman Justin. Were you just out here in three sixteen? I said, Yeah, yeah, we were. When we see you guys, we're kicking your asses. We're explosion <laughs> in here. So we let the coal go out. I mean, it was kind of funny story, but it probably took them till three in the afternoon to get the fire out. <laughs> but we forget all that. But we were going and so getting so depressed. Our captain would call up. There was a chief in the 6th Battalion. I heard him mention before on uh, on your podcast, Chief Nemenchek. He was the de uh, deputy commander. <clears throat> Great, great guy. He turned out he was a fire instructor in Suffolk. Old, salty guy. In fact, he saw us, he saw Mike and I in our group stretching. We used to stretch, fire escape stretch. We used to have a fire, when you get on, you got a fire escape on. Yeah. We took that into a right in the garbage. We'd stretch around the fire escape, and he used to grab our officers because we did it more than once. And we did a quick stretch. It was like an interior stretch. That's how right. we Right, we right, right. And he used to grab an officer, never fails. When he was a deputy at a multiple and we would stretch it, he would say, if I see that act again, he goes, I, first of all, I didn't believe what those guys did. They got up there like unbelievable. But if I ever see you guys do it again, there's going to be hell to play, pay. But we used to just have, you know, if there were so many lines going in the interior, instead right, of- Right, you'd have to go up the fire escape. Yeah, yeah. So Third one up the fire that. escape. <clears throat> but we- uh, so we're interchanging and our captain would call and he'd always, he got, he started by saying, Lou's wife's having a baby and any day we, we, we got to keep the boys back because the senior guy's not going to stay. <laughs> so he wouldn't go. And then that kept going on. And then Chief Patterson, that black chief, I said there was a great guy. On a Friday or Saturday when the interchange came, he would he would grab the officer and they when I'm not, I'm not knocking that but they were old time guys they probably half of them probably did fire great fire dude but now they're you know they're older and they yeah, yeah, yeah. they would come in and he would grab the lieutenant always shake his hand and go listen Luke if you don't mind the freaking natives are getting restless tonight we think we're gonna have a good night would you mind going back and and we'll stay so. They would go back and we'd stay. Yeah, yeah, would, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'd do the childbirth again. And finally, Nemechek would call our captain. And he said, listen to me. He said, over the last four months, according to my calculations, you've had 73 babies in your flight. <laughs> 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 so we went to, <clears throat> to change. And then we went to, uh, to uh, 259 for a year. And then we went back. But it was funny because while I was there in the old time, there's no way better stories than me, but we'd have the bells. They were weaning off the bells. 
So we would have the bells from nine to noon. And you've probably heard stories about Pamplona, Lieutenant Pamplona was a tough, tough guy. He was from 42 truck, the elephant man. He was one of our lieutenants. And he was just, if you looked at him, you got intimidated. So he, he, we're, Mike and I are sweeping the apparatus for 83 shoots by, lights and siren, 29 shoots by, lights and siren, the bells. It was like 9.30, they banged out the bells and we never counted them right. <laughs> but for by God's grace, so he would always come out and he was just an intimidating guy, great guy. And he would just look at you and he'd go, excuse me? Who, who's, who's counting the bells? And I point to me, I point to me. We were off one digit, but if it went from two one or two two to two three, so we thought- Yeah, you don't go. Three. Yeah, yeah, you don't, you're not going. It was our home box right down the <laughs> 83, 1075. <laughs> thank, thank God it wasn't. So yeah. he, had, he had one of the senior guys for like just almost like a joke but he he had them bang out and mike and i had to count the bells to make sure we got the bells right but i had a pamplo was such an intimidating guy one of the guys like i said 10 guys came probably seven went to the engine and two of the guys want to quit because he was just that intimidating and i got I lucked out. I got in good with him because we had one of the Bronx Spectaculars. I worked New Year's Eve. I'm only on the job three months. I probably got to the firehouse August, September, maybe September, October. New Year's Eve, we get a tremendous job, occupied building. And I was a volley in one, two. I knew what fires were, but I look up and this thing's going from the first floor almost through the roof. It was And it was occupied. People are coming to, all over. They had lit which they did commonly by us and other places. They lit the stairwell up and took everything. They wanted to kill somebody. And so they lit the whole freaking thing up. Well, I get out of the rake and I, I'm looking up and I fall over the curb. And Pampalone gives me a look and he's going, oh my God. This, this, is, <laughs> this so, is the guy I got, yeah? <laughs> oh my God. So uh... he didn't know what to expect from me or what. But anyway, it turns out I'm the fourth guy on the line. We have a... We had a guy that was one of the biggest guys in the fire department at the time, uh, Bruce, and he was about 350 pounds, but he could move. He, he actually skied pretty well, but he was enormous, enormous. And guys always wanted to get behind him because he blocked everything. So <laughs> he had the nozzle, Bobby Wasp, who eventually, great fireman, eventually was on fire patrol, then got, on, and got to 17. He was at 60 that night. He was back up. Then we had this guy, Tommy O'Connell, who was a legend in 83 and 29. I mean, tremendous Nazareth. He was stirred. And then they had me. And we're moving in. And we're moving because we got to hit the first floor so the other companies can get above us. So back then, at times, you'd, it was an interchange company. You always left the guy on the floor to make sure they had the fire floor before you start stretching up. If it was our guys, 83, 71, 41, you just went up. You didn't wait. You knew that guys had it. So we started to move up. It was a long hallway, and I hear screaming. I'm like, oh my God, what the freak is this? And I'm up three months. And next thing you know, Bruce Wickover, all 350 pounds, they're passing him or trying to pass him out. He gets burnt bad. So he's being passed out. 30 seconds later, Bobby Wass, the backup, he's screaming. He gets burnt. They're backing him out. So the next thing I know, it's, I'm that, I'm the, it's Tommy O'Connell, the greatest Muslim in the Navy trade. He's next, and Pamplon doesn't want him. They, he wants me, the probie, and he's screaming. He never wore a mask, and he's screaming, get my probie up here. I don't want a detail. I want my man. I'm like, oh, my God. Everyone's burnt. And <laughs> I'm him. getting the hell out of here. <laughs> he's, he's the Don Mack, that's what I'm doing. <clears throat> So I get up on the line. He pushes like Tommy O'Connell behind him, and he sits on my leg. I'm in the you know the duck position. I'm going to do duck walk, and he sits on my leg. Pamplone back then was probably about two thirty, solid. And I'm on my leg, and I'm screaming at him, "Get off my!" Oh, no, I'm screaming at him. I want to move in. That's what I said first. 
and I had a mask at the time. I was brand new. I had to put them. So he's going, you're not backing out. I said, I, I, I want to move in. I want to. <laughs> you're not going anywhere. So finally, I ripped my mask off and I said, you're on my leg. Let's go. <laughs> 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 And we did a good, you know, we did a good job. And from that point on, he still would yell at me, but I was like his, Mike and I were like his pride people because he, it was a tremendous fire. I think it went to a third or fourth alarm and we were first through and it was, it was, it was good. It, it's funny because I look back and I fought house fires in one tour. You know, we'd get 10 jobs. I must've went to maybe 30 or so, 40 house fires lines in one tour, the first time. And there's nothing like a tenement. I know, you know, a lot of guys haven't fought tenements or maybe they have, but especially when they're up in the upper floors, because you're walking up and people are coming down and you know the fire's up there. Whereas, and I'm not knocking house fires, but a lot of private dwellings, you're almost met with the fire. You don't have time really to stretch and there's the fire generally, or maybe you go to the second floor. But here you walk and we have five and six stories fires and in the railroad flat and you're walking up and you're going this is fantastic and a funny story about that with mike Steele. we like i said we were the nozzle team he never tried to fight me for the nozzle vietnam vet he was a platoon leader in vietnam tough tough guy but he'd always be willing to be my backup and we had a fire of course from the 4-0 another spectacular in fact patty mcandrews our senior chauffeur later said I never saw a fire blow out a window. That It blew out, not just out the window, it blew like almost across the street. It was the fifth floor of a six-story tenement. And uh, we, we're going up the four old precincts across the street. And as we're going up, you know, you got to get around the newer post going up. And we got to get to the fifth floor to put it out. And the truck is, wants us to get there. They're going to go above. In fact, Pete Lazinskis, one of the tre most tremendous firemen. He came on just after me. Big guy. He was. I was talking to you about him. He was Lieutenant 117. But he had a lot long career before he became. He took the test, and he metal guy. He got a good grab, a good medal and a good grab. But we're walk. Steele and I are first. You know the trucks wait. We're trying to get up the stairs, <laughs> and the four old cops barrel past me, going down the <laughs> stairs, just like push me out of the way. And I got the knob and you know, you got to fold and I'm, I'm getting ready to get to the fire floor and drop it. And as we're going from, I guess the third to the fourth, the fold, the fold won't go anymore. And I'm like looking down and there's Mike, my partner. And this is the way we were. This is a typical Mike Steele and me story. We're trying to get around, the hose won't go. And I yelled down, Mike, get the hose around the newer post. Is it stuck? He goes, no. I said, well, get the hose up here. He goes, I don't think so. And I'm looking, I'm yelling down at him. I said, what do you mean you don't think so? He said, the cops just told me, don't get up there. You're going to get killed. Now, he was I'm, holding it. That was my experience. And then we went up. But that, nice. that just relaxed everybody, you know, to hear him. Don't go up there. The cops told me it's in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> but we would go up and, 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 you know, do our job and do our thing. And it, 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 we just had... We just had fun. In fact, it was funny. We had a covering, we had a lieutenant that got there his first day. And again, Mike and I, I hate to keep saying Mike and I, because we had Billy Lawson, we had Tommy Martin, we had Eddie McCallan, all fantastic firemen. Tommy Freshour, uh, Jerry Rooney, I'm missing a bunch of guys, but all fantastic. But oh, like, Daddy. Mike, missing Ho Daddy. Ho oh, Daddy. <laughs> you missing Ho Daddy. <laughs> Mike and I always, oh, generally would work together. So we get this, um, we get this uh, uh, a job and uh, over in Harlem, because we go through and do a lot to Harlem and get action in. You know, we got our own action in, go into a 69 and where my son wound up 59 and guy companies like that, 80 engine. So we get a job over in Harlem, it's good fire. And uh, they needed two lines on the top floor. So we'd stretch a line and got to the top floor. We come back. And Tommy LaPolo is an officer, great, great guy. Funny guy, you always laugh, but we don't know. This is his first, first tour and we get this job. So we pull out of quarters and he's banging. You, you guys are officers, I wasn't. You're banging on the window. Well, he's banging on the, banging on the window. We get back from the job 
and we go out, and we had a yard, so we're going out in the yard and having some water to refresh and all that stuff. So Mike goes, why don't you go in and ask the new lieutenant if he wants to come out with us and have, have some water? So I says, yeah, all right. So I go in and I said, Lou, would you like to come out? So he goes, yeah, yeah, sure. And he's always smiling and laugh. So he comes out and uh, he's in the yard. And after my second or third glass of water, I said to Steele, I said, I got to talk to him. And there's a whole bunch of guys. We're all out there. You know, we had a good job. We're all out there talking about the job. And uh, so he comes out. And I says, Lou, can I talk to you a minute? You know, and the guys are listening. He said, yeah, what's up? You're Jimmy, right? And I said, yeah. He goes, oh, no, the captain told me about you. And my... I said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, forget about what the captain, I, I'm trying to talk to him. Yeah, well, well, what do you want? I said, no more banging on the window. <laughs> he goes, what? And now he's looking at me and he's got the grin like your left. And I says, Mike and I want no bang on the window. Bangs out. He goes, what are you talking about? We don't want to know nothing until we get to the job. We like to be surprised. Stop banging on the window. I said, if you start banging on the window, right when we leave quarters, him and I get very nervous. We don't like that. We don't want to know nothing. We don't like that. We don't want to know nothing until we pull up in front of the building. But it was it, it was a good story. And another Mike Steele story. He just called me today with it. I had forgotten about it. We get a brownstone in the basement. Now, you know, the brownstones have the basement and you got the cellar. And we get a fire in the basement. And we go down. And we Chief Francis was the battalion chief. He was also a lieutenant or captain in proby school and he was in charge of mike's squad i was squad one he was squad three so francis gets mike to helps to get mike to 60. you know helps him he tells our captain marmon when 60 pulled out listen i got a guy for you mike Steele, marine prim and proper he's a good guy for 60 and that's how marmon recruited him and then word got out of me and stuff like that so we get this job and francis is the boss and we come out, we knocked this thing out like a, nobody knew we knocked it out that quick. We got in there and freaking blew this thing apart. Come back out, we're high fiving each other. What a job! Look at that! Puppies coming in, all out, don't worry about it. <laughs> all out, don't yeah. worry about it. Yeah, we're, we're high fiving. <laughs> Francis comes over to steel and he starts screaming at him You freaking asshole! I thought you were gonna be something! You're at nothing. And Steele's looking at him. I mean, you know, Steele goes, what, what's, Chief, what's Tony? I taught you at Proby School on a brownstone. You go to the floor above and protect the interior stairway. And he's screaming at, this, at Mike. And he's going, yeah, but Jackson let us in. I don't care what he let in. That's <laughs> where you're not going. So great job. You know, maybe another company might have taken a little bit longer. You know, I don't know. But. It was just a spectacular, and we're high five, and he screamed. So and he's angry. To, we get back to quarters, and Mario DeSeno was on there, so God bless him. The calmest lieutenant, one of the calmest we ever had. He was from 108 Truck, I believe, and got promoted. But all my guys, which is kind of cool, all the guys who got promoted, the lieutenants, all had 15 or 16 years. It wasn't like you had seven or eight years. These guys were all salty. And, and they got promoted. So, um, in fact, one of the guys, um, one of the lieutenants came from 90 Angel, which is a single house at home, very busy back then. I, he comes into quarters, he's got a big scar down it, and I love that. My captain, great fireman, all busy hauling companies, pretty boy, no scars. I want scars. <laughs> I want scars. <laughs> so this guy, lieutenant pretty boy. Comes, he's got scars down his face and all this. And I go, hey, Lou, he got, gets the spot in 60. I go, where were you from? He goes, 90. And he goes, uh, I'm going to teach you guys how you stretch in, around the newer pulse and stuff like that. I said, Lou, I said, first of all, how long have you been, been lieutenant? Like 15, 20 years? Old time, beat up. I mean, he's beat up. He goes, uh, about five and a half hours. He goes, <laughs> 20 years from busy company. So he's going to tell me how to stretch. I said, Lou, with all due respect, you have way more time than me. You got to see Mike and I stretch on the fire escape. Then you'll know how to stretch. But he was good. So we're downstairs and we're BSing and stuff. I got to know him a little bit. I said, by the way, where'd you get that scar? I mean, did, did the floor collapse, the ceiling collapse? I mean, the big scar. I go, no, I was leaving work. And he said, I went off the side of the road on Cross Island, hit a tree. 
<laughs> but uh, he he was a he was a real real good guy, great officer. He actually was doing a chief a favor, and he went to one hundred three truck, and oh. he didn't like it. He went in later in his career. <clears throat> he wound up going to a slow engine. But he used to, you know, come back to 60 a lot in the parties. And I said, how's it going there? I go, they're busy. He goes, busy? He goes, they barreled me down. They, they, they're on the, they're the opposite. You know, we were like gentlemen. Sometimes we take the pole, no barreling anybody, but on the way to go. But he, it, it, was a, it was a good time with him. And uh, uh, hey, hey, Jimmy, I want to ask you a question. How come you never, yeah. you never wanted to go to the truck? Well, here, a good story, funny story, quick story. <laughs> I get through about five or six years, and that's what we were told back then. You go to the engine, if you're assigned to the engine, do five or six years, and he goes, and then then you can go to the truck or think about it. So the captain of the truck asked me to come over, and Mike, and uh, so we're going to go partners. We're going to go across the 417 truck, and uh, I go in. I had an Irish cap. We had two Irish captains. One was very strict, but he knew what was going on, but he, he let, but he was strict, Captain McGrail. He came, Marmon leaves after a year, McGrail comes. You couldn't understand one word he's saying. I drove him one night. I was a backup chauffeur, but I was probably the worst backup chauffeur in the city because I never wanted to drive. So I, I didn't have my heart in it. Plus I never knew the streets. We had small area I go to, but he would, um, I remember driving him to a job and I'm going down a block and I'm going, Cap, do I make a left up there? Do I make a right? What? Do I make a left? Do I make a right? And I don't know what he's saying, so I make a left. Perfect English. He goes, I told you to make a right. So, <laughs> like, no brawl. The brawl left him. But anyway, the captain of the truck come over. So I grabbed Mike. I said, Mike, I'm going in and I'm going to ask the grill for fill out a paper. I'm going to 17. All right, all right. You go in first. I said, no, you go in first. You're the Marine. Go in first. You're the Marine. You go in. So I wind up going in first. He throws, I forget the form, CD, whatever the form was. CD30. CD30. I get the form. And, you know, it takes a little while to fill it out. So I'm in the office 10 or 15 minutes filling out this form. And uh, I get done filling out. I said, Cap, I just need your signature. I'll walk it up to the battalion. He goes, <laughs> you think I'm signing that? I look at him and go, what? You'll go nowhere. You're going nowhere. And tell that other idiot that's listening at the door, he's not going in. He wouldn't let us go because we were the senior men at the time. Our senior, I had three years or four years. <laughs> guys had left, I was senior guy in the firehouse. Or one of the senior, I don't mean the senior, but one of the senior. Joe Sullivan went to the truck. Paul Tangerman went to the truck. Dennis O'Connor got promoted lieutenant. Went up to 59 truck. Pampalone left 60. It's amazing and how left, fast it, that happens too, right? Wow. When you're in the firehouse, it really is crazy. Unbelievable. You think so you got I like wound, a sweet spot, everybody's good, and then everybody's gone like yeah. that fast. So we wound up, uh, I didn't transfer. And then after he ripped my pen, he, threw, he let me fill everything out and threw it in garbage. And I said, and he, you know, he meant, I understand where he was coming from, but he could have told me when I walked in. He let everything go. And then that bro, you're out of here. So I, and, and he knew Mike was at the door. It was so funny. And tell that other idiot at the door, he's not going anywhere either. So we both stayed in the engine. Mike, I don't think really wanted to go. I did. Hmm. But uh, so we, we stayed in uh, 16. We did our career there. I mean, uh, I, I, Mike became a backup chauffeur. I became a backup chauffeur. But like I said, I, I, my heart wasn't in it. Uh, we got, we got another captain. Uh, Captain Giblin, who just passed away, he was a little Irish leprechaun. He was our captain. He was just a funny, funny guy. And we had a job once with, we had a lot of stories with Giblin, a lot of, you know, I, but anyway, we had a job at a, uh, it was a printing press with that crazy smoke. And we're in there, the meal was on, we're just about ready. We go in there, Chief Kilk is the deputy, and he's standing there. And we go in and I happen to tell Giblin, by the way, Cap, let's put this thing out quick. The meal's on. Well, he gets on the air with the radio. He calls the chief's aide, Richie Mills, who's a black guy, good guy. He calls the aide of the 14th Battalion and he gives him the whole meal, the recipe and everything. Richie, 
Go, this is in the middle of the fuck. The fuck <laughs> the Companies are coming in, they're darking down because there's a big building. They're in the side of the building. We're in this part That's of the building. That's great. And we're making headway. Giblin does it. He, you know, I yap. He yaps like a, and it, with the Irish bro. You could hardly understand him either. And he's going, all right, all right now let's just go back and turn the potatoes off and, and turn the meat over and put that on 350. Well, Kilka hears this and he goes, is that that little leprechaun out there in, in the fire? And the aide goes, yeah, it's uh, Captain Giblin. Go in and get him out and get him back to quarters right now. So next thing you know, I got the radio. I mean, Giblin's back in the cheese car going back to no he, shit. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. He just wouldn't stop. I mean, he was just a funny, funny guy. But Kilka was funny <clears> because <throat> we had a we had a good fire. I'm, now I'm at the latter part of my career. We had uh, we come out with no mix hoods, and I don't reckon you you got. I tell my son, you got to wear the hood. You got to wear the hood. But you know, back then I just was set my ways. I'm not wearing the hood. I wore the bunker gear when I came out, <clears> but I'm not wearing the hood. So we had a tremendous fire on 138th Street, second do, and we didn't know it. Rescue found it, actually. It went to a third alarm, a fourth alarm, and we were second do, and we had to go to the floor above it. What it was was we thought it was on the first floor, 83, tremendous fire. They went in. They couldn't, they couldn't really find the fire. Tremendous heat. What the guy had done, the owner of the building, is he put those – inch or three quarter inch steel plates around the basement in the basement and he had all jewelry stored in he owned jewelry shops and he kept all his jewelry in there and he didn't want anybody to get in there so the basement other than this steel door had all steel plates around it so you couldn't see nothing and the heat was burning through we lost i think two or three people burned through the first floor burned through the second floor and I think it burned through the third. And we had the second floor. And we had a chief, Bernie Mullins, who had come there. He was from 103 Truck. Great reputation. Tremendous fireman. Even a better chief. He was one of the boys, if you know what I mean. He was fantastic. So he was the chief on that second floor that we had. 83s pushing. They can't hit nothing. Nobody's hitting anything. Right. You're not, you're not t- hitting the fire, right? And I get up to the second floor. And I push into the apartment and I'm in about two feet, uh, about 10 feet. And I can't go an inch further. I had no hood on. My ears were on fire. And I'm saying, I, I, I got it. And Bernie is down the hallway, no mask. I had no mask. And he's yelling to me, hold that. You got to get in there. He's yelling, you got to get in. Nobody knew. If I had gone, and I'm not, again, you have to have hoods. But if I had gone another foot or two, because my ears were covered, you went right down to the basement. And mm. we're lucky we didn't lose anybody. We lost people. In fact, one of the bedrooms just went right down into the basement. Wow. And it was Rescue 3 had come down, and they spotted a crack <clears throat> in the brick, and then spotted through it, and we realized the fire was full, fully involved on the, in the basement. Mm. And then we went outside and, and you know did the next day, punched holes through the brick wall. Then I had to go through the steel plates. But uh, it was a tremendous fire, and uh, if if the hood, you know, yeah, I got gotcha. you. You never know. A funny thing with the hood, my career's almost ended, and I'm going to go back to the beach for a second, if you allow me. <laughs> I worked seven years at the beach. My friend, who I got a job at the beach, becomes a Suffolk cop. He works about four years at the beach with me. We were the ambulance drivers, and he calls me. He goes, "Did you ever get any time for working at the beach?" I says. No, why? He said, well, I put in for it, for the pension bureau. I filled out all these, there's a lot of papers. You may get some time. So I fill the papers out, months go by. And anyway, Roby, my captain, calls me in and he goes, Sam Smolowitz is on the telephone, the top of the phone. And I'm going, <laughs> come on, Cap. The captain and I were very close. So he goes, I said, Cap, come on. And he goes, no, Smolowitz is on the phone. So. I pick up the phone. He goes, uh, Johnston? I said, yeah. He goes, well, kid, you hit a home run. I said, what are you talking about? At the time, I had just about 22 years. He goes, uh, you're getting seven years back time. I worked seven years at the beach, but just summers. You know, 
uh, uh, July, August, uh, June, July, and August. I got seven years. They owed me like $25,000. I went from tier one to uh, tier two, back to tier one with the death game. It was like my captain is sitting there going, because I used to tell my captain, I don't have to study. I'm going to get a field promotion to look up. <laughs> what the freak is a field? I said, what? And so he hangs up. I hang up the phone. I says, Cap? I used to I got- call him the general. He would call me the colonel. And I said, General, field promotion. There it is. So I there it up. is. And with everything changing, the job changing, the EMS was getting, things like that. I said, you know what? I got 30 years, which back then was a lieutenant's pay. And I says, you know, it was a long time ago. I probably should have stayed, but I went. But Captain Roby was uh, one of the best captains. We had a all good officer. <clears throat> he was one of the best officers. He got mad at me twice in my whole career. And it wasn't really mad, but he got mad. And it was funny because I told you I hated to be a backup chauffeur. I don't want to back. I'm, if I'm driving and you got a job, nobody's getting water. Nobody's getting water unless I'm on the line. That's the end. I used to joke about that. So Patty Mack is now retired. He was like my hero. Been through the war years. Great chauffeur. He couldn't hear. And he didn't know what to pump the pressures at. I'm a volley. I'm saying 20 pounds. Friction laws, 150. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got it all figured out. What do you pump at? He goes, are you kidding me? What do you mean pump at? If they want more water, they'll call me. I just rev it up a little. I just rev it up a little bit. That's what he does. So, and then he told me, which I never should have listened to, we had a bunch of projects around this also. And he says, if the project is less than half the building, the fire is less than half, don't hook up. The head pressure coming down to say, and we had 20 story projects. So ninth floor, eight, four, seven, you don't have to hook up the head pressure. So we get a job on the backup show for right down a block, one of our 20 story projects. It was on the eighth and ninth floor. I'm counting the floors. This is great. I'm not hooking up nothing. So I hook nothing up. Nothing goes to the standpipe. And Captain Roby's the boss. He comes back. Hey, a good little job. Puts the mask away and he goes, uh, Hey, Colonel, how'd you get the hose pack so quick? I go, what are you talking about? I'm going to tell you something, and this is the last time I'm going to tell you. You're not Patty Mac. You'll hook up for everything. Every time, right. He got a little mad that he did another time. It was funny. We had an EMS down the block. I like it. We had EMS down the block, and by this time, for a number of years, I do nothing. You know, EMS. I'm, 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 I'm out of it. So uh, we get this EMS run, and um, I'm the chauffeur. And uh, no, no, I was the one on the back, but I was senior man. Roby goes in. The, the general goes in. I'm the last guy to go in the apartment. Sunday, I sit down and I'm gonna read the back of the of the paper, see what sports going on. And I'm reading the paper, and I hear, "Oh my God!" And I'm like, "Holy shoot! What the freak is this?" So, Next thing you know, EMS comes in, and here comes Captain Roby with the boys. I go, what's going on? He goes, what's going on? Where were you? I said, I was reading the paper. He goes, well, we had a leper in the back. We had a, a leper, which we never knew. Skin all peeled off. He had leprosy. Oh, everything, my God. Everything peeled off. So I go, really? So we get back to quarters before the engine backs in. I dive off the rig. And I'm back by a slop sink where we had the antiseptic. You're washing everything. And I used the whole antiseptic. And <laughs> Captain Roby comes back and he goes, what are you, out of your mind? I said, what's the matter? He goes, there's nothing left. We were in there. I said, yeah, but I read the guy's newspaper. Well, we <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I read his newspaper. He just looked at me. And it was another chauffeur story. Then I'll get off the chauffeur thing. And this was, I, I should have the bosses were so good we had. It just, <clears throat> they let everything flow. There was nothing that we, I used to tell the junior guys, I used to say, the bosses know nothing. It all goes through the senior guys. You don't go in to the engine office and bang that you want this done or a three way mutual. You were, you're mad at that. Everything goes through the senior men. You leave the boss. So our bosses were all left alone. But we get a job, we pull out a car, I'm driving. I'm sure. I pull out. The project across the street, about the seventh or eighth floor, guys hanging out the window, and smoke is pouring over his head. 
And I'm like, oh my, well, I used to lose my mind when this happens. So I get down the block, first do obviously, I don't hook up. This was before Roby gave me the lecture, I would have hooked up. I had Lieutenant Cook was my boss, great guy. I, pu I pull in and I, Jack Ryan was a senior guy in 17 truck, great fine, great senior guy. He had, he had about 30 years on. So we had just had the roof rope with that big hook, uh, you know, the belt and all that stuff and the rope. So it weighs some money. So I run over in my head. This is a true story. In my head, I'm thinking I'm making a grab. I'm going out the window. So I grabbed the rope from him. I said, Jack, I'll take it up. So I run up. I was in pretty good shape. And I run up to the seventh or eighth floor, uh, the floor above, and 29's up there. And the two biggest guys in 29, Dennis Trubert, muscle band, big gorilla, and uh, <laughs> Gonzo, Ray Phillips. Like Gonzo. Yeah, 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 Ray. Ray, yeah. Ray, Ray was a great guy. He went to Rescue 3. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So I pull up, and I'm up there, and they're, they're going to tie me off and lower me, lower me down, and I'm making the grab. I'm getting the grab. So now they're figuring out how do you tie the bowling and all that stuff. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, I go, you guys are so big. Just lower me by hand. I don't need to throw all around the belt and all that stuff. So they're taking out the child gates. And I got a leg just about on the ledge. I'm going out the window when we hear from inside, Lieutenant Kelly, and I forget who the other guy from 17 got the guy out. They made a great grab, got a medal, got the guy out. Well, I come down and Lieutenant Cook is at the engine. He goes, uh, you didn't hook up. So I said, no, do you, have, do you have good pressure? Yeah, yeah, we had good pressure. Where were you? I said, uh, I said well, I don't know how to tell, but he was such a great, great, great guy. I said, I, I really don't know how to tell you this. He goes, what do you mean you don't know how to tell me this? I said, well, I had one leg out the window. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, I had this contraption wrapped around me. I don't even know if it was a slip knot or whatever knot he had. So he goes, let me get knot. this straight. How do I write this up if you did grab the guy? That my engine chauffeur. And my chauffeur runs up. Second grade <laughs> the first two engine chauffeur. First two. Oh, first two. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. <clears throat> but another thing. I Hold on. Do we have that? Is that the picture that we have, Jim? With those two guys? Was that, was no, that the picture? No. no. I want to show the that? picture quick. I want to show the picture of with your son in the picture. Okay. That's a that's a great picture, and I want to talk about. Oh, sorry. No, no, <laughs> there it is. No, that's... not that picture. <clears throat> when he was younger. Oh, the uh, that's the uh, little one. Okay, hold on. Let me get the ten year old. Yeah, show them all. That was that guy on the left was my captain, Captain Roby. Great, 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 great guy. And on the right was a tremendous fine, a good friend, Jimmy Gilligan. He was one of the bigger guys in our truck, and yeah, Roby yeah. was fairly big. And that's uh, that picture. I think my son was twelve. And we got a, he rode with us, a, you know, the guy back then you could ride a lot. So I was one of the few guys that brought this son in. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's probably why I wanted to be a fireman. Plant but a seed. little after that, we had, we used to get a lot of good car fires. You know, not that they're good, but every day because we had a commercial area where they dumped the cars and we get a good car fire. We had, we had an inch booster reel on the back and I stretched this freaking thing off and, uh, Roby goes, Colonel, what are you doing? I says, a uh, car fire. What do you mean? What am I doing? You know, to the, to the captain, general. So he goes, why is your son here? I said, well, he's just, give the line to your son. And at 12 or 13, he put out a fully involved car fire. About it. We, we stood back a little bit. You know, we didn't do what, you know, when you're right up at the car, but he put out a full car fire by himself. No help, all by himself. And it was so great. He got Roby the bug. Loved, well, we love my son, and that was it. But I want to give one story, if I can squeeze it in, because I hear you guys talk a lot about rescue. You know how they sometimes they take over. I know in Brooklyn, you know different things. We had rescue three; it was far away, and and um, by the time they got to us, we really had no interference with them. And I liked a lot of the guys, Jerry Murtha. Uh, they had a guy, Joe Looney, I believe, and a lot of convoy, a lot of good guys from rescue. And Ray Phillips went up there. 
but we we get this good job and we're four above the fire and it's mike and i and we're putting this room apartment out above the fire and we're whacking this line around we get it out and ralph copler was our lieutenant he was like us he wasn't really our boss he was like us we socialized he lived on the island we do everything together well He's in the fire. I'm in the fire. We get it all barking down. We move out to the hallway, Mike and I. Cop was still in there looking, you know, with the light, looking if there's any pockets of fire. Rescue is coming up, just, I guess, for the heck of it. And the ceiling collapses. <laughs> and Cop, to begin with, was one of the ugliest lieutenants. I love them to death. <laughs> <laughs> ugly. <laughs> ugly, ugly, ugly. So the ceiling now comes down. And rescue is coming up, and they hear it, and now they, you know, they're right, <clears> and they good, great guy. I'm missing, but then right away we got to collapse on the second or third floor wherever we were, and we got to go. So they yell out, "Is anyone in there?" So I yell back, "Yeah, our lieutenant." So they're not on the radio. We got an officer trap. So I said to Mike, "I said they're gonna they're gonna barrel us over," and we knew Copla. And this is how funny we all were. And thank God was always with us. I said, Mike. Rescue's not going in there. Coppola's getting out on his own. He doesn't need any help. He'll be out. So rescue comes to the door and they go, we got to get in there. there. There's a lieutenant trap. So I look at the guy from rescue. I said, we're well aware there's a lieutenant trap. He's our boss. So they go, well, we got to get one and get him out. They go, no, you don't. Give him a minute. He'll crawl out by himself. And, throw him out the middle of the and they look at us and go, I cannot believe that you guys didn't make a move with your boss in there. We've been with him a lot of times. He always want, finds his way out, but it was just hysterical. Was no, he like, looks like he looks like he had some tra traumatic damage to his face. Now nah, that's how he always looks. Nah, that's how he looks. <laughs> he, was, he was banged up there, but it was just a it was just a great career. And hold on, and, let's go through some of the picks quick, and then there was yeah, a couple of questions. Let's go. Yeah, through go the ahead. Picks. I'm sorry. Just, yep. All right, I'm just gonna let's go. Uh, I don't want to miss it, but we have some go of the, your family. Uh, St. Patty's St. Patty's Day party. Uh, one first. Uh, where do I have that one? Where do I have that one? Oh, I got one quick story I got to tell. This yep. is a great story. I'll, I'll try to go quick. Oh, yeah. Chief Gant, Chief Gancy. Great guy, Chief Gancy. Yeah, so let's show that picture. Show the Gancy yeah. picture. And I'll tell it, it'll be a quick story, but you, you got to hear this one. That's a tremendous story. That's my wife and Chief Gancy. We're at a volley dinner. Okay? Prior to that, uh, you, I heard it mentioned uh, his nephew was on your show, I think recently, Angelo Catalano, 124th Trump. And his nephew was a guest on one of your shows, and I can't think of his name now, but Angelo was a great guy, 124, tremendous fireman. He was a big, big guy in the county. He was a commissioner in one of the volleys, and he started the fire museum in Natural County. So he's going to have a big hoop de doo for the opening of the fire museum and we're having it at Eisenhower Park. It's like a catering hall. And we're all there and I'm there, my wife and all the girlfriends, all the, I'm a chief, so <clears throat> all the chiefs are invited with their wives and a lot of the chief's wives are there. So I used to like to flirt with all the women. So I'm there and this is no. women all dressed with a tilt and all that and I'm, I'm, in, I'm in heaven. And I'm getting ready to go over to talk to this group. And Angelo grabs me and he goes, Jimmy, you got to do me a favor. There's an invited guest at the party. He's uh, chief of department, Pete Gancy. Oh, me and chiefs, you know, I respect, but I, I don't know. Him. So he goes, could you go talk to him? He really doesn't know anybody here. And he didn't. So Angelo kind of drags me over, pulls me over and he says, uh, Chief, I want to introduce you to Jimmy Johnson. He's a chief in one tour. He's also in 60 engines. So I see Gancy and I go, hey, chief, how you doing? I said, and my first words are, listen, chief, I don't want any favors. I had about, I don't know, 18, 20, whatever years it's six years. No favors. I don't want to go anywhere. I'm just here to talk to you. And I said, I really want to look at the women. He looks at me, he goes, yeah, yeah, they're really nice. I said, yeah, so we'll, let's chat for a few minutes and I'm out of here. So I chat and I leave. And it turns out he sees Tyler, my wife. And I don't know anything going on. I'm talking to other people at the party and all this. And Chief Gancy and her 
I guess we're talking. I don't know nothing, but I know the next thing I know is she doesn't feel good and she's got to go home. So I'm, I don't want to leave, but I, you know, she's really <laughs> sick. So I said, let's get in the car. So we get in the car and we're driving. As we're driving, she says, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I am sorry. I said, well, it's all right. I said, we all get, I said, I'm that way every day. We're fine. You're all right. I said, it was fun while it lasted. And she goes, yeah, but I threw up on your battalion chief shoes. <laughs> so I said, my battalion chief, she goes, yeah, yeah, that chief that's there, I threw up all over his shoes. So it turns out she, she threw throws up on dancing. <laughs> God bless her. Another guy that was at the thing was also, he was a 332 engine. He met Gancy just briefly and introduced himself. He was getting promoted to lieutenant. The ceremony is two weeks from this incident. So he goes up and Gancy congratulates him. And he says, tell that guy Johnson he owes me a pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was hysterical. So that was my story with Gancy. Then we went to a couple of dinners, folly dinners he got invited to. And uh, we, we just became very, very good friends. And he, he, he liked my wife a lot. And we went to one game at the Coliseum, a hockey game. And you know, Gancy and Ron Essen, they, they had a, you know, sometimes they didn't quite get a, well, they're watching the game and Carol and I are pulling up to go to the one of the upper seating. And we look over the ledge and there's Chief Gancy and uh, Commissioner Von Essen. And I tell Carol, I go, your boyfriend's here. And by this time she had a, a nickname for him, Love Pocket. So she yells over the balcony, hey, Love Pocket. <laughs> and then yells, well, I'll be right there. And we talk about the love pocket. Where did this come from? And it was just, it was just a great Chief Gancy story. It, it was a fun story. But he had, he, he had come to my firehouse. We had a guy, John Hannon, good, good kid, uh, tough kid, rugby player. He got killed in an accident on the way leaving the firehouse. A tire on the Deegan, a tire came off the tractor trailer crushed the car and killed him. So a while later, he had donated all his organs. Um, and so a while later, we had a big ceremony at the firehouse and with Giuliani, uh, Chief Gancy was there, you know, and all the dignitaries and the people who, who were the recipients of his organs were there. Wow. Big bitch. And in, in court, if we pulled everything out. Wow. So Captain Roby, General, the generals, he's there. And Giuliani and Vanessa Lee, and I go right up to the general. I said, General, permission to go below our basement. And he goes, Colonel, permission granted. So I get the word out. Everybody, you know, in the submarine, we all go down. <laughs> and, you know, we're hooting and hollering. And with that, I, my good friend, Al with Tony, good fireman, his wife was leaving. So he comes down. He says, Why don't you say goodbye to Carol? Because Carol's wife is, and I were pretty close, very close, rather. So I go up to the apparatus floor, and the apparatus is all out. And as I go up, I say goodbye to Al's wife. Him and Eddie were very good firemen, Billy Welsh, good guys. And as I say goodbye, Roby calls me over, the general. And why he called me over to this day, I'd love to ask him. He knows I'm coming up from below ground, up, and there's the chief and deputy chief D. Bernardo, still on the apparatus floor, talking to Roby. So apparently Gancy says, you know, you got Johnson here. Is he, is he here? And Roby goes, of course he's here. So they call me up. I say, salute Chief DiBernardo. I salute Chief Gancy. We talk for a second and Chief Gancy goes, I want to talk to you for a minute. I said, yeah, all right, Chief. So he moves me over and there's our cast iron heater, steam heat with the pipe chase going right to the basement. And it was like a microphone. So, <laughs> it was like it was like being in Studio Fifty Four, <laughs> and he puts his arm around me and he goes, "Do you remember when we first met?" I said, "Yes, I do, Chief." He said, "You said you never want to leave that company. Now I know why. I wish I could join you." And that was, I think, that might have been the last time I saw him. Yeah. Wow. Touching thing, but. Now your questions. I've talked enough, I guess. There was there was a couple of oh, there's the chumper. Chomp, 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 chomp. I was trying to find the St. Patty's Day one. I don't, I don't have one that's Mark St. Patty's. Uh, 
so there was some questions that people paid for. Yeah, uh, I uh, I'll go let's back. Do to those that. now, and then we'll do the old school tip. The uh, we already answered this one as if you work with John. Uh, how do you say that? R O H. John Roar. Yeah, John yeah. Roar. Yes, okay. he was our chauffeur. Good okay. guy, very good guy. Head of the uh, student society. And the only other comment that was that was Trucky. He was asking Trucky one one seven. I don't know if you want to uh, talk about this, but uh, he's can you read that? Okay, you want me to read it to you? Yeah, that. <laughs> Allegedly, yeah. so you may not. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. No, there was another one. If he asked, if he worked with, uh, there was wasn't there somebody else? Uh, they wanted to build uh, this one. Somebody wanted to say hello. Carl Hauser. Hauser says hello. Yeah. He's watching with Artie Workle. Workle. No, there's another, another one. one. Yes. Oh, yeah, that one. Yeah, and then they wanted Billy to be, Larson the, stories. Billy Larson stories. Billy Larson stories. Who is one of the best firemen? He, him and I were like brothers. He he was in D.C. Went back to a very slow. Oh, race. that's the same guy you were talking about. And I got him to sixty, and then he went to seventeen. One of the best firefighters, but I can't tell Billy stories. They were, they were little. <laughs> 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 All right. Enough said. Enough said. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you just a fun, not a story, but Billy used to carry a pencil in his in his pocket, uniform pocket, and one of the new guys comes in. And he goes, "Yeah, I met, I met Billy had a little guy." Tremendous, tremendous. He didn't wear a mask. I had it on, but seldom put it on. You should should wear a mask. So I want to say that. But Billy didn't wear him. He wore a bandana. That was his Scott pack. It didn't weigh anything. He'd wrap it around. Little guy. Fucking incredible. He, he carried this pencil. And I, I won't tell, but I, I'll leave it for the imagination. And one of the probies goes to Pete was this his great fireman, the metal guy. Pete was straight out, good guy, good show for a tremendous fireman. And he goes, hey, Mr. Dulziskis, what what is the little guy, Billy, where, have that pencil? Is he like a construction worker? And he goes, no, it's the Starr's Coffee. There are a hundred more Billy's. Which are <laughs> that was a Billy story. But this, yeah. Billy was a great, great guy. Mm. Great fireman. Uh, Still one around? Day he broke, one day he drove the rig, rig back. We were, and engine was eating, the truck went out for some stupid day. We come back, the quarters is covered. It was like, it smelled like 500 pots burning on the stove. Our mouth, our throat's closed up, everything closed up. Billy decided he's going to take the run in without releasing the maxi brake and wondered why the truck oh was my gosh. 3 miles an hour. Oh and when my he got God. back, all well, you saw the officer. You, 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 you. And, uh, I think his pencil was uh, wet or whatever. Uh, <laughs> Billy, uh, yeah, Billy lost a great guy. Got him there. He took DC and we 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 were volleys together. Father, his father was captain of me and the volleys. But hmm. yeah, great guy. Always with yeah. the must long mustache. And we we got the we got the uh, you guys will remember. So we started with the rabbit tool and then we went to the um, hydro ram. Hydro ram. And Billy was a little guy, but very strong. But you know, you had the mask on, you had the hook on, you had this on. If we go to a good flyer, Billy had to go to the top floor. And fortunately, he said he looked, but I don't think he looked. He threw the rabbit tool out the window. And he says, what are, you, what are we, 17 trucks? We got to carry this thing, 55 trucks running around with one hand carrying the rabbit tool. So he tossed the rabbit, uh, the hydro ramp. Yeah, yeah, the, the rabbit tool was heavy, man. That was yeah. heavy. But Billy, little Billy, we <clears throat> lug all this stuff up, and he's a tremendous elevator guy. We call the motor elevator. He can open a, a stuck elevator in two seconds. But that's a Billy story. Yes. Well, don't forget if you want to, really quick, you uh, want to talk about your son, or yeah, you want to yeah, that for another yeah. show. I tell you what, he, he 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 did good on the test. Got called, and I had a a good friend and a great fireman, Mike Waters. He, I got him to. Uh, to 60 engine, he was bouncing around in Brooklyn. He was from Hunts Point. And I got, I begged and begged and begged. And finally, the captain said, All right, I'll bring Waters here. And uh, he brought Mike there. And Mike knew everybody on the job. Union guy, he could tell stories a mile a minute. I don't know if he'd come on the show, but he, he's a tremendous story guy. And I, we get him, and um, he knew all the union guys. And he was part of the year. I forget what he was, a rep for the battalion, whatever he was. And I said, I want my sons getting on. I always loved, I loved where I worked, but I loved Harlem too. And they were still more occupied and busier than 60 
when my son got on in 2007. And I said, all I ask is scout it out. I want senior officers. I don't want five-year guys. I don't want six-year guys. I want them to go. You know, I started to worry. I know what I went through and close calls. So he <clears> said, 59 engine is for you. EJ Tierney was up there. Jimmy McCluskey, tremendous guy. He was a lieutenant up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pat Cleary. Nick. Nick. Uh, Nick Nicolello. Yeah, yeah. Good, re Nick good recovery, Mav. <laughs> <laughs> All those guys were there. So I, I, I had pulled through Mike Waters and he got him there. And then when he got promoted, uh, Joe Brosey, I had broken into. He ran. He was running flips at the time. And uh, Jimmy Hodgins, not Chief Hodgins. It was a Jimmy Hodgins. That was my captain for a while at 17. Good fireman, solid guy. Um, he put up with our nonsense. We called him the dentist because he drilled day and night. And, <laughs> but he, he was he he was on the stage when my son got promoted. He came to me, he goes, Jimmy, wherever you want him to go. But Joe Bros, he pulled some strings and stuff like that. So he coming to, you know, in the Is it two eighty nine now? He's a lieutenant two eighty nine. He's maybe a year, a little more away in the captain. Captain, so good for him. We'll see what happens. Yeah, good fireman, very good fireman. He got a good, good medal. He made a great grab. He he worked in a truck. You know how luck goes. He didn't work off at a one three eight. He works at a one three eight. They get a a private dwelling, but it was one of those private dwellings in Corona where you had they had twenty two people in the yeah, house. Yeah, a lot of people always. And, all, and most of them were all trapped. And he went above and. Uh, uh, he Does he ever do this? Do you ever hear him do this? Rear. Rear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rear. So off the old block. You know who was there? I don't know if you know the name, but he was a captain here years ago. It was Tom Neary who just passed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tom yeah. Neary was a legend on the job. And he yep. was captain 138 for a little bit. But uh, yeah, he loves it there. And uh, when, you, when, your son, when your son went to the floor above, he wasn't the first to show for, was he, by any chance? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Coops, I got to teach guys what I know. I <laughs> All right, so you can start now because it's time for your old school tip of the day. Wait a minute, I got more pages. I got more yeah, pages. <laughs> I told you we're going so to. You, you, you already said the beginning he wants to come back for a part three. Yeah, so yeah, he's already got that. himself all lined up. Oh, dude, I love so, it. We can do a part two. Well, I just right. got to say one quick thing, not a story, but I had moved to Myrtle Beach and a bunch of my engine company was down and we all moved down within blocks of each other. And I had uh, Chris Murphy, who was my good friend. He was, lived right next door to me. He was in the 60 with me. Mike Waters, my boss, Eddie McCowan, Albert Tundy, Paul, big Paul Quirk is a real good storyteller from 40, 27 truck. I mean, a big guy and a funny, funny guy with stories. Jimmy Ryan was from 227. I met a lot of the guys, a lot of guys I worked with at 60, we all moved together. And then I met these guys from 227, Ken Big, Kenny uh, Begby and Pete Clifford from 44. All great guys, they're still down That's there. That's good that you guys are all together like that. It's a I lot, must I be a lot of laughs. I wish oh. I was with them, but yeah. And you know what? This is the first time I told stories because these guys all heard my stories. <laughs> it was always in a bar after about 14, 15 beers. I would get these stories and they loved them. I think he had Clint on. Yeah, yep. Timmy Clint. Timmy Clint. Yeah. Timmy, I think it's Timmy. He, I yeah. met him down there and a lot of guys, Bobby Hoyne, a lot of guys, um, great firemen, great stories, but I, I, they used to tolerate my stories. So it was kind of funny. And I hope. I think most of them are watching. They'll probably call me after this and say, yeah, "Shut yeah. your mouth." <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff, there, uh, Good Jim. Stuff. Good stuff. But so, if you want the tip of the day, yeah, hold on, hold on, right now. Stand All right, right. Guns. here we it's go. Time for it is time for old school, school tip of the day. Day, day. day. All right. All right, kid. Take, take it away. away. Okay, first I'm going to just give a personal tip for the day. And I, I, I was talking to Coops about it before. Guys that are on the job, even if you're on the job, but especially if you retire, uh, be an advocate for your own health. Because there's a lot of times nobody else is looking down for you. Uh, I had some serious health problems. And I went to, instead of going to something else, I wound up going to Duke Hospital. Go to the best. Uh, think of yourself and your family and be your own advocate. 
go out of the park if you have to look for a good doctor or a good hospital. So that's my personal tip of the day. Uh, the other tip, firematic tip of the day, is obviously what you guys said, stay low, let it blow. But if you get into a company, pick, pick the brains of the senior men. Not only do you want to hear uh, their good stories and, you know, uh, things of that line, but you want to hear the tradition of the firehouse. You want to know what the firehouse you're in is all about. And there's nothing better than to just, when I got on, I picked the brains of Patty McAndrews, Tommy Mahoney, all these senior guys, Gino Vitale, uh, John, uh, uh, Jimmy Brown, uh, all, uh, Bill Lauder, all these guys. Uh, and now you got young guys in 17, like Steve Pitts and Tommy Fresh, guys like that that still run Tommy Martin. They still run all the ceremonies we've had and kept the tradition alive. Lieutenant DeSalvo, guys like that. So keep the tradition alive. And the only way you can keep it alive is by picking the brains of the senior guys, not only fire stories, but find out what the what their what your particular house is all about. And that's that's my two tips of the day or three tips of the day. I love it. Oh, beautiful. Well, wait, the old school tip of the day is brought to you by what, God? Oh, gee, oh. Well, it's, it's going to be brought to you by... The FD Collectors Club is a monthly subscription service that delivers fire department patches and challenge coins. No more stopping by a firehouse just to find out they're out on a call. Start and grow your collection today. Boom, boom, boom. Great dude. He's a good dude. He's in squad one, that guy, right? Yeah. Rough Tom. He's the bird box guy. Yes, he's in the, he's in the squad. Yeah, great he guy. Is. So go over there and check it out. Challenge coins, patches. He's got a lot of stuff going on, that guy, huh? He's yeah. a busy dude, man. Yeah. But we also wow. also we have to do the health and safety tip of the day, John. So yes, let's get yes, that we blasted did. out before we, we say our goodbyes. Stand by, Jim. Hold on. Yep. The First Responders Center for Excellence is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to protecting the lives and livelihoods of first responders. Their education and research initiatives aim to bring greater awareness and understanding to the challenges to the health, safety, and well-being of firefighters, EMS personnel, and other first responders, too. They are an affiliate of the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation. I'm going to give you three tonight. You ready? So diesel is a known carcinogen. Use exhaust Capture systems in the firehouses to reduce exposure to diesel exhaust fumes. Thank God. Healthy lifestyle choices are important for firefighters' health and fitness. Maintain a healthy diet rich in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. And also, you know, this is my pet peeve, exercise regularly to promote overall health and fitness. Like the chief said, uh, like uh, the chief, hello. Like Jimmy said, you know, you have to have a stake in your own health, man. You have to be an advocate for your own health. Positively. Yep. Without a doubt. And Jim, we got to have this man on again. Great, great job. stories, man. A lot of stories. laughs. I Thanks. appreciate it. You could see, uh, you know, I, I like, uh, you know, you, you get, you're wearing it right on the sleeve, brother. You know what I mean? It's uh, good Thank stuff. You. Love the job. Love it. You could yeah. tell. And uh, you ever told us how you got the, 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 the name Ho Daddy? Yeah. Ho no, Daddy. we were supposed to. I still, I know what it is. It's just a surfer thing. It was my thousand bucks. Yeah, you didn't come up with that. <laughs> no, guys. no, it's not. You're full of shit. I you're full of shit. Yes. You're from Florida. Maybe you do know what it is. <laughs> yeah. I used to do the whole act in the, in the late 60s with the jams, that's with the bathing suits and the surfboard and all that. And Billy lost the guy, the little guy, the he was surf, and I plant my board in, but I didn't know how to surf, so I sit there talking at the women and say I'm a surfer. And Billy turned around and says, "You know who you are? You're a hoe daddy." And then he thought it, <laughs> when I got him over to sixty and seventeen, that stuck. Made, yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. The common theme the, of pretty women in this man, Ruffy. Have you noticed that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like it. He married a looker too. Good for he him. Knows how to do it? Absolutely. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Any uh, shout outs, Ruffy? No, we got uh, we got some good people coming up. Uh, yes, on Monday, Monday. Monday we have Chief John Newell coming on. Oh, uh, that's uh, Jimmy's golf partner. <laughs> one so, day I met him. Yeah, <laughs> there he is. Oh, there you are. Back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> there my it wife. is. Looks like my wife. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow, <laughs> nice. 
All right, All guys, right. thanks again for uh, watching, tuning in. I think we had over 100 likes tonight, right? 115 what I saw last. Uh, WW2 was keeping me Let's in go. Tune. Share with friends, bro. Share the podcast. We need to grow it. And uh, get your orders in for Christmas. Right, Ross? I don't want to be sitting at that engraving table. Uh, no, no. It. No, I'm out. And uh, that's it until uh, Monday. Stay low and go. All right, Jim. Thanks again. We'll see you at the big one, everybody. All right, guys. Have a good night.